están sospechosos de un de este. Bienvenido. Gracias. Good trip. Well, I was in Rome, Paris, and here now, so it's a long trip. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for your patience. Um, my name is Cindy Arnson. I'm the director of the Latin American program here at the Wilson Center, and it is truly a thrilling occasion for us to be celebrating the 40th anniversary in the presence of so many of our former directors, our distinguished colleagues who have been fellows here, people who, from our advisory board, um, and so many friends around Washington, and I, I, um, I'm, I'm truly honored to be here. Um, to mark this occasion, we wanted to have a conference that would focus on some of the most important and pressing issues for Latin America today, but which had anchors or roots in the historic work of the Latin American program. There are obviously many issues to choose from, um, but today we have settled on one that is central to the future of democratic governance in the region on the one hand, and on the other to the possibilities for greater regional integration and inclusive growth in an era that has seen burgeoning challenges to globalization. So we'll devote the morning session to an exploration of corruption, a problem obviously with deep roots in the colonial era, but which has burst into the public consciousness for a number of reasons, um, including the demands of a more educated and connected and prosperous civil society, as well as investigative reports by the media and the growing strength and independence of institutions, particularly the judiciary, where a younger generation of judges and prosecutors has committed itself to strengthening democracy by insisting on the rule of law. Part of our objective today, as we hear from numerous experts from different countries, will be to identify the specific factors that have allowed some nations to reduce corruption and improve adherence to the rule of law while other attempts have faltered or failed. We will focus on cases such as Brazil, where the judicial system has played a leading role, um, on cases such as Peru and Chile, where national governments have convened high-level commissions to investigate corruption and make recommendations for reform, and cases such as Guatemala, where the international community has played a decisive role in supporting national institutions to investigate or prosecute corruption. This afternoon, we'll, we'll turn our attention to international issues where changes in the global arena have upended fundamental assumptions about trade regimes and patterns of regional integration. The U.S. withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the renegotiation of NAFTA, which is ongoing as we speak in Canada, and a broader bl backlash against globalization in some parts of the world are elements of an external environment in which some Latin American countries are exploring new patterns of regional integration and global insertion. How is Latin America responding to these trends? What positive or negative results could emerge from the effort to renegotiate NAFTA? Will China, which presented itself as a champion of free trade, at uh, the, the APEC summit in November of 2016 fill a void by what many in the region perceive to be a more protectionist United States? Are there real possibilities for convergence between the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur? These are some of the questions we will explore. Um, before turning the podium over to Abe Lowenthal, the founding director of this program 40 years ago, to introduce our keynote speaker, President Fernando Enrique Cardoso, some thanks are in order. First, to our outstanding staff, to Eric Olson, deputy director, to Jacqueline Dolezal and Anders Beal, to our dedicated interns, to my distinguished colleague, Paulo Sotero, the director of the Brazil Institute, and of course, to those who have supported this endeavor with their financial resources, the Tinker Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and also the Inter-American Development Bank. Without their support, this discussion and the sub subsequent publications would not be possible. 
thank you very much. I'd also like to recognize former director Joe Tulchin. Um, I think Joe and Abe are representing. I don't know if Lou is here, but he will be here tonight. Anyway, thank you for joining us, Abe. As you can imagine, I have lots of things on my mind to say, but I have strict instructions and I'm a reasonably disciplined person, so I will turn to the matter at hand. It is a high honor to introduce Professor and President Fernando Enrique Cardoso. Fernando Enrique has had several remarkable careers. As a social scientist with pioneering work on several issues, especially associated dependent development. As a key strategist of Brazil's transition from military rule to democracy. As the finance minister who assembled a splendid team of economists to design the plan to stop hyperinflation. And then, with great clarity and transparency, convinced Brazilians to accept it. And then, as a twice elected president with remarkable accomplishments in his terms. As president, Cardoso championed human rights social justice and affirmative action, but he also firmly advocated macroeconomic prudence and showed a healthy respect for markets. Since leaving office, Fernando Enrique has been a successful institution builder, an influential public intellectual, an astute political counselor, and a wise elder statesman. Allow me to underline just one further contribution. Fernando Enrique was the first person to accept Albert O. Hirschman's invitation to join the Latin American program's incipient academic council. He worked closely with Guillermo O'Donnell to help me avoid errors that might have affected the program's credibility in Latin America. He offered sage and firm advice to the Wilson Center's director that protected the program's integrity at a delicate early moment. He was a key proponent and participant together with O'Donnell, Philippe Schmitter, and Lawrence Whitehead in launching the program's flagship transitions project. And he was an important founder of both the Inter-American Dialogue and the Brazil Institute, each of them developed under the umbrella of the Latin American program. Please join me in welcoming back our friend, Fernando Enrique Cardoso. Good morning, dear friends. I will ask you a favor. Let me speak from, from the place where I am. Because, you know, I'm 86 years old. It's a little bit too much to, to be all, all time speaking from this platform. It's, it's tiring. <laughs> Anyhow, let me say also that when I was coming to this place or just before to pick up the car, I received a note from Sergio Fausto in, in, in suggesting that it would be better to, to speak in Spanish. Well, I did the, tape, the paper in English, so I go mix. Some parts I will try to be more strict in, in English, and when I will go to enter into Latin America or Brazil, uh, if I will be uh, still ca capable to speak in Spanish, I will try to, to, <laughs> to, to express myself in, in Spanish. Anyhow, I, I would so thank you very much for the invitation. And as uh, Abe told, I have uh, long connections with this organization. I remember quite well when I was uh, in, in Princeton, in the Institute for Advanced Studies. I have been there as fellow twice, and in one of those occasions, we met uh, Abe, and Odona was there too. And the, uh, the key person was Albert Hirschman, who was uh, really the person who inspired all of us at the time for, for a Brazilian and for Latin America to be part of the uh, Institute for Advanced Study was almost a dream. My, my neighbor in the office is, was Thomas Kuhn. The professor of anthro anthropology was also a, a, a very well known professor named Clifford Gertz. And in history, an English name is John Elliot. 
and, and Hirschman and others like that. So for, for us, it was really something uh, as, as, we, we, as if we were on a, the sky. And there, we start discussing the possibilities to introduce, in some parts, programs about Latin America. I remember quite well a trip we did together from Princeton Junction to New York, and Abe was pushing in that direction. Then we joined, not quite far away from this place, in the castle, the, the head bricks building. Then was the place in which we, d we have the, uh, the, the our initial debates about, uh, well, what now is this ma wonderful place? Well, I could imagine at the time that even a Brazilian center would be located here under the, con the leadership of Paulo Sotero. So for me, it's very pleasant to, to back again, be here, and to talk uh, more openly <coughs> with you. As you know, the subject proposal is a sub subject which we I'm not acquainted. Is uh, corruption. I never been have been a practitioner, <laughs> <laughs> nor, nor, nor a theorist of corruption. So I will try to give a more ample uh, approach, starting from a sociological viewpoint to, to try to understand what is going on. Uh, well, as you know, everyone knows, uh, our countries in the so-called Anos de Chumbo, that is, that is to say, under dictatorship, our countries were turned apart by dictatorships and by the logic of the Cold War. So the logic of my generation, the aspiration of my generation was very simple, economic development and democracy. These are the main targets we are looking after. In the 90s, when I was uh, already involved in political matters, more, uh, on top of that, we had the, the tremendous problem of this, uh, inequality. So we had also to address to the inequality problems in our, in, in our world. But in the 90s, the world was already more than changing, it was ch changed already because of the great uh, uh, technological transformations. They were paving the way for robotization, the internet, the revolution in communications means, and the transport. This pro produced a tremendous tra transformation and, 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 and enhanced the resurgency of the new classical economy in the academic life and of economic liberalism in politics. The new world, structured around private multinational companies evolving into global companies, was bound to reduce the traditional functions of the national states. A new ideology was on the rise, and it was branded as new liberalism by its critics. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, America, uh, the Pax Americana, who existed with the and uh, Europe is starting its processes of integration and the emerging of China, allied with global corporations. It's not difficult to understand that in such a context, most of Latin America left opposed globalization, understood as a threat to national independence and a surrender of the elites to new liberalism. At the end of the 90s, and in the first decade, in the year 2000, populism was born again in the parodies of the Kirchner's, the Bolivarianism or socialism of the 25th century of Chavez, and even Lula's government in Brazil, although in that case with a moderate tune. In Venezuela, Chavez emerged as a superstar with its uh, mix of verbal populism, distributive politics, and strong anti-American rhetoric anchored in the Cuban experience and more recently, more recently in the economic and political interests of China and Russia. But this regressive trend did not become hegemonic in the region. Chile and Uruguay, countries with some tradition of social revolutionary movements did not follow this path. The democratically elected governments of the Concertación 
and of the Frente Amplio were concerned with promoting sound economic policies as well as integrative social policies. The populist wave was also rejected by Colombia, where successive governments stood for democracy to, to deal with the threat posed by narco-traffic and revolutionary guerrillas. And I would say, even in Bolivia and Ecuador, politics of social inclusion were implemented together with more responsible economic policies. Is within this framework some uncertainty, but democracy was resilient. It is at this point in time that a new crisis is now unfolding. Before I qualify Brazil, let me stress that even in the regions where representative democracy is more deeply rooted, rooted that is to say, Americas and Europe, their institutions are facing a bad moment. At the core of those problems, we find the widening gap between people's aspiration and the capacity of political institutions to respond to the demands of society. The entire political system is seen as elitist, contaminated by corruption, oblivious to people's daily concerns. And this phenomenon is not local, nor transitory. It is embedded in a broader economic, social, and moral transformation <coughs> that affects society as a whole. Some thinkers go as far as to speak of a paradigm shift, a civilizational change. It is one irony of our age that this depth of trust in political institutions coexists with the rise of citizens' increasing capacity of making the choices that shape their lives and the future of their society. I just came from Paris yesterday. I was there in a meeting with some uh, French sociologists some, uh, and some others, from Turkey, from Italy, so on and so forth. All around, uh, the, the, the process is the same, a kind of lack of, of confidence on democratic, in democratic institutions. This is not, by consequence, only a phenomenon occurring in Latin America. You know better than myself what's going on in the United States. It's not that different. So, and this, I, I think, this, uh, are, uh, so this transformation produced by the transformation in the productive system, new forms of communication, so on and so forth, are the key uh, to understand the contemporary worlds. When I was a university student, and maybe a bit later, when I started to teach uh, economic history at the University of Sao Paulo, at the beginning of the 50s, long, long, long time ago, most of you were not yet born, uh, it was fashionable to think about change, social change, education for change, so on and so forth. Yeah, at the time, there was a passionate debate, at least in Brazil, about the consequence, positive and negative, of what Hobsbawm used to call the era of imperialism. Despite amazing levels of human exploitation, the progress of industrialization and urbanization gave rise to a new culture based on secularization, separation between state and religion, and individualization. This was a passion for us, the secularization of, of the culture, society, so on and so forth, individualization, so were uh, being uh, the, the, the consequence of the industrial revolution and the urban uh, revolution. On the negative side, <coughs> where the colonial expansion of Europe and the formation of an economically <coughs> prosperous center which controlled over technology and capable to accumulate of accumulating capital. In contrast with the periphery, dependent on the center, were not colonized by it. Throughout a long period, standing from the American independence, independence and the French Revolution to the Second World War, the institutions of representative dem democracy gained ground in the West. Ney's passive defeated and communism was contained. It's this world that is being affected by the mutations that, we, that is described as a world crisis. At the core of the civilizational change are technological transformations, <coughs> or to keep it more simple, the communication revolution 
and it, its impact in society, in economics, and in culture. Even the classical distinctions by tennis, for, ex for example, between community, which was the locus of people's face-to-face -face experience each other, and society, the kind of social organization which people relate, relate more formally to norms and contracts, needs to be revised. Today, the tribes formed in the internet link people to each other without the intermediation of formal organizations. Like-minded communities of all kinds are created trans transcending any barrier, including national frontiers. On another level, the optimistic hope of an author as Karl Mannheim, who, when I was teaching, was uh, for us a kind of pillar of a vision of the future, with his trust on planning and the positive outcomes of a rational world, is being replaced by a more pessimistic and particularistic <laughs> culture. The emphasis today is on race and cultural differences. The politics of identity challenges the politics of classes, contrary to previous expectations that socioeconomic difference would prevail over differences based on culture or race. I don't want to bore you with uh, theoretical approach, but it's obvious that even if you take Durkheim with the, Durkheim's ideas ab about the social division of labor, the forms of the types of solidarity, either more mechanistic or more organic, all this was conceived in a moment in which it was very clear to oppose the pre-industrial societies, pre-urban societies, and industrial societies. Even Weber, with the con concept of rationalization, the, the, the the, the threat poses by bureaucracy, the charismatic leader as an instrument to uh, safeguard society from the control of, of bureaucracy, so on and so forth. All of that has been very, very important and crucial to describe uh, this Brazil, uh, world society, Western society from the end of 19th century up to the mid of the 20th century. All this re requires some rev revision to be acceptable as instruments to understand what's going on in present, in current days. So, if it, the, the, the transformation is so profound, why do we talk about the crisis of representative democracy when the mutation we are, we are witnessing is much more profound? The world of yesterday, based in the society of classes with its political institutions, the parties, representing different class interests and values embedded in their either ideologies no longer exists as they existed before. Political parties are institutions born in the 19th century, a, and as mass organizations encompassing peoples outside of the world of power, the socialist and the communist parties enlarged the legitimacy of the democratic institutions. But the old forms of, of sociability and links of cohesion have been overturned by the fragmentation of society, the rise of new occupations, and the intense social mobility of contemporary societies. This profound transformation in the fabric of the contemporary society led to a disconnection between po the political system, the parties, and society, and on the other side, the people. The cleavage, the tensions, and the conflict in today's globalized world are determined by a set of disparities of a different nature. 20 years ago, in the so-called South, feared that globalization would increase the distance between a rich north and a poor south. Not only this did not happen, it is enough to look at China's world role or poverty reduction in several southern countries, but something totally unexpected did happen. Within each rich country, they are winners and losers of globalization. The French sociologist Pascal Perrineau he speaks of a new division between the happy and the unhappy with globalization. Uh, uh, Perrineau uh, used in, 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 in the, the French word of uh, mondialisation. La mondialisation malheureuse et la mondialisation heureuse. <laughs> those who feel at ease in the new global environment and those who feel victimized by force beyond their control leading to a profound sense of personal and social loss. Is this phenomenon, I, I, I ask now, is this phenomenon not confirmed by the overwhelming vote pro-Trump in the Rust Belt? 
or by the pro-Brexit vote in the depressed rural and industrial re regions of England? Or conversely, the victory of Macron in France, was it not achieved with the massive support of the prosperous cities and regions which see the European Union as an asset and not a threat? We can deny that the working class and the union-based voters of the British Labour Party supported the Brexit in the same way that the workers who voted for the Communist Party in France migrate in large numbers to Marine Le Pen. What united these voters? Old class consciousness or the new feeling of loss or gain with the transformations in their society? New majorities are, are being formed around messages and leaders who vocalize them, or narrative Trump, Le Pen, relies on fear, anger, and hate. Another, Macron, on hope, competence, and self-confidence. The new populism, based on the fear of the future, has a meaning which is quite the opposite of the Latin American populism, which was nationalistic, but wanted economic development and social inclusion. Today's populism in Europe and the United States is also nationalist, but in the sense of a Regressive utopia, if I can put like that, which is a contradiction in terms. <laughs> in longing the, 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 for the return to an idealized past. It also supports social exclusion of minorities, immigrants, and all other kinds of people that do not conform to their moral prescriptions. In an unexpected twist of history, Arabs, Mexicans, Africans, all coming from regions torn apart at the era of colonial imperialism expansion, now appear as the contemporary barbarians at the gate of civilization. Walls and prohibitions are invoked to keep America for the Americans <coughs> or France for the French. In another paradox, the same web that connects corporations, flows of capital and technology across the globe, also connects terrorist cells, launders dirty money, and empower cyber pirates. In a nutshell, the crisis we are now living is the emergence of what could be the contemporary society or the network society, network society, Manuel de Cassel's expression, uh, that is driven away the modern society created by the Industrial Revolution. <coughs> of, so that is, um, uh, I'm trying to, to, to make a, 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 a distinction. We are passing through a, a profound transformation if I can give a name to this information, say it's our con contemporary society. So what is an empty name, contemporary society, against the other one, a modern society. Modern society was the consequence of industrialization, urbanization. Contemporary society is a consequence of internet, to put in it more, more directly. Well, the fact is that of the world of yesterday, we only see the ruins. On the emerging world, only the shadows. This overall process of change evidently affects Latin American societies, but there are some specifics. Many of our countries, after getting, getting rid of the military re regimes of the Cold War times, tried to rebuild pre-existing democratic forms whose structure reflected oligarchical societies. In some cases, there was a kind of fusion between previous democratic forms and populism, supported by the many who want a place in the sun in the urban industrial society. In other countries, depending in part on the volume and density of society, to quote from Durkheim, the relatively small number of those demanding access to modernity, mainly to universal social service provided by governments, facilitated the establishment of democratic rules in the European and American tradition. Countries with large pro populations and those more affected by populism had much gr greater difficulty to make this adjustment. All, however, suffer the effects of what I call the rise of contemporary societies and of globalization. Well, at this point, and in order not to speak beyond the, a reasonable time, I will turn to the case of Brazil. In our case, as in some others, the overall crisis of politics is enhanced by a moral crisis arising out of the disclosure of a widespread system of corruption. So we are suffering some similar consequence uh, in terms of transformation that are occurring in other parts of the world. On top of that, we have, again, also to add a moral crisis 
as a, a consequence of corruption, the enlargement of corruption. Well, uh, first a statement. Today's collapse is a result of the persistence of a political culture based on patronage and corporatism at the moment in which Brazil makes the transformation from modernity to contemporaneity. So I think it's very important to stress a cultural aspect. Uh, I was, for, as you know, for a long time a uh, member of the Brazilian parliament before to become a uh, member of the executive branch. Uh, it's difficult to change institutions. It's extremely difficult to, pr to <coughs> promote uh, a new institutional order. We are now in Brazil debating about what, what, how can we do to arrange the political system and so forth. But more difficult than that is to produce change at the cultural level. So what I'm stressing here is that we passed through democracy. We made a mix between democracy and populism. So now we are being affected by the, the world transformations. But the persistency of you know, uh, corporativism and clientelism, uh, this kind of thing, uh, is more difficult to, 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 to take into account and to modify because it's rooted, profoundly rooted in the, in, in, in the soul of, of, of society. So this is a, a, a problem. Uh, patterns of electoral behavior and power mechanisms that were traditionally accepted now appear as dissonant and intolerable. An informed public opinion is now aware of the evidence of corruption at a systemic level. So this is what is behind. Uh, it's a kind of shock, my God. We are modern, you have democracy, you have institutions, but you have corruption. My God, and the parties, the parties are linked to corruption. If the big corporations, so good big corporations, which we, we are proud of, of, them, of them, so now we are, we are seeing they are also involved in a, in a more vast process uh, of, of corruption. So it's, it's a shocking situation. Let me say, do you want that I ch change to for Spanish? Do you prefer the Spanish or English? English. English. <laughs> if, if you want, I, I, I can't change it. Spanish is not the, Spanish is a sub-Portuguese. It's not difficult. <laughs> <laughs> German is a little bit more difficult, but <laughs> Spanish, <laughs> anyhow. I would say the institutional framework of the Brazilian democracy was established by the constitution of the 1988. The landmark in the transition to the rule of law, the constitution, was appro approved one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. It incorporated several inconsistencies in the economic sphere with affirming political and civic rights, including in the social sphere. I was a member of the Constitutional Assembly. I was even a uh, co-rapporteur of the Constitution. Parts of the Constitution I did myself. So uh, uh, what I'm transmitting to you is like, like almost a testimony. So we were really uh, absolutely uh, passionate with the idea of freedom. So no rules. Uh, that's why the Constitution guaranteed full freedom for the organization of political parties and ensure the political pub, uh, the, the, their partial public financing. So we will also de decide that the president to, to, be, to be elected uh, had to, ha to receive the absolute majority, that is to say at least 50% president votes, either in the first round or if not, in the second round. Well, this is a, a pres constitutional prescription. But we, we, we wrote in the Constitution that there, there are no li limits, no barriers to prevent the creation of new parties. The result is that today we have 28, 28 parties inside the Congress and a queue of maybe 40, 50 new parties coming to become uh, player in, in the political game. And in all cases after the Constitution, no one president elected by majority. I was elected twice in, in first run with more than 50%. Well, my party never got more than 18% of the seats. Lula was elected 
twice uh, in second round, with certainly with more than 50 percent. But the rulers' party never had more than 20 percent. So uh, the situation made it imperative the formation of parliamentary alliances in order to govern. Even adding the seats of the three main parties of today, PT, PMDB, and PSDB, they hardly join forces, hardly. They are against each other. But suppose you put them together, they account today for less than 200 seats in parliament out of 513 seats. So the three big parts together are minorities. Huh? And governments to get success in approved legislation depend on the alliance between parties. So we create a system uh, who was characterized by a political scientist named Sergio Abranches, <coughs> presidential system by coalition. We are forced to enter into coalition. It's impossible to govern. But the rule of the presidential election uh, motivates people in another, another way. The presidential party won the election. The president is a powerful man. He's a, in the case of Brazil, he's almost an emperor. So why he is not delivering? <coughs> Population never understands the tactics, the maneuver inside the parliament to organize a majority. They don't understand that the majority is not uh, done by, 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 by vote to the president. The president has to build a majority. And to build a majority means comp to compromise. So even this system, coalition system, has been always looked after uh, some suspicions because of the fact that you are, we are joining people oppose each other during the electoral campaign. I have a little bit more chance because I made a big alliance with the three, three big parties before the election. But it was dramatically criticized because one of these three parties was uh, center-right. And this was not acceptable for centrists, not to, spe not to speak about the far uh, leftist people. But this is necessary. Lula did the same. All, all, all are forced. So then I will give some links with corruption in this. But this, is, this came from the Constitution. We are forced to, to operate in, in, in that way. And the, 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 the parliament tried twice to, to impose a barrier in, the, in terms of the proportional votes that each, each party has to get in order to be uh, apt to have a, a seat in Congress. The Supreme Court said, no, no, no. It's impossible. The Constitution is, is, uh, uh, says that uh, we, uh, the parties have free uh, organization, uh, organization's uh, choice. It's impossible to impose, impose barriers. Well, even the persistence of the patterns of patronage and corporatism, compressed, to say the least, with favor and privilege, the executive builds political alliance by sharing power through the nomination of politicians to public functions in the state and in the public companies. This has been the way how this, uh, this political system in Brazil was created. You have to uh, share power with some people who, who not necessarily belong to your party, and more than that, sometimes oppose at local level or party. While it was possible to form congressional majorities based on three or four large parties, this system se seems less corrupt. The party composing the alliance were united, at least formally, in their support to the presidential candidates program before the election, as I did. Uh, so they are supposed less corrupt. What I'm saying is, since the beginning, some grains of corruption were embedded in the system. If you can, uh, not, this is not necessarily personal corruption, but political corruption. Lula's election coincide, coincided with two independent and positive developments. First, the presentation prior to the election of, of a letter to the Brazilian people. In, in this letter, Lula uh, as, assumed the engagement, the engagement in some basic pillars of the previous economic policy. And it's not necessary to repeat to you, it's a little bit boring, but the, the, the uh, uh, law of fiscal responsibility, uh, floating system of, of, of exchange uh, rates, uh, targets to control inflation, so on and so forth. This was a, a, 
a positive step ahead because in the transition from one government to another one, some parts have been placed uh, by the previous government will, will continue to be working. This was important. And second, as you know, the international ex ex uh, terms of exchange moved very favorable to exporters of primary f uh, goods because of China. So the big problem we had in the past, uh, external debt disappeared because uh, China was in increasing in such a way the price of, uh, of primary com of commodities and uh, we are so so good in producing commodities that it, it was possible to transform the overall picture. Well, uh, I think that uh, missing this favorable opportunity to move ahead with uh, an agenda of constitutional reforms was a mistake by Lula's uh, government, then enjoying an international and external very positive uh, scenario. Instead, it chose to focus on strengthening its base of support inside and outside the Congress, and in doing it, opening the door of the state to a large and heterogeneous conglomerate of political parties, big and small, rightists or leftists. And it also ensured the access to state funds to private companies arbitrarily designated as national champions. Sooner rather than later, politicians realized the advantages of creating new parties, no matter how small in size or vague in ideas. So what has been a possibility, and more than a possibility, a condition presented by the Constitution is start to be, to be, to be undermined because the, the, uh, several groups in, in political life discovered that it's better. Since the, the, the system is like it is, let's organize a party. Let's segregate three, 10, 12 uh, members of, of the parliament, and let's put pressure on the government. And the government, to, to, to receive the vote of these people, has to make some concession, either to appoint someone to, to the exercise of, of, of a position, or maybe to, to give the control of a state company. This was uh, uh, not in, uh, day, day by night. This was a, a process, a kind of long transformation, you see? And the, the point is that now, that's the reason why explains the fact that we have 28 parties. There is no possibility in, in, a, in a spectrum of ideologies or political consistent targets to imagine 20 or di different positions. It's not that the case. We have the parties became almost a corporation, aggregate and ag aggregating people interested in enter into the state. So this was the transformation. Why I'm, I said that it, was, it will be possible for Lula, I don't like to criticize those who, I know the situation is always very difficult for each president, that's not my aim. Anyhow, at one point in time, one decision had been taken, the decision was, instead of to make to an alliance with a big party, at the time was the PMDB, at the end the PMDB became a, a, a allied, but at the time the decision was, let's instead try to to organize the small parties. Well, the result was what in Brazil is uh, well known as mensalão. <laughs> that is to say, uh, people in parliament receiving on a monthly basis illegal financial contributions to support the government. This was in the first, in the first Lula's mandate. But still, was something uh, as, a, as a whole not enormous a moderate amount of, 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 of corruption, but inside the parliament, and using money, not just appointing people to positions, which was normal, even if you know that in appointing one person, this person probably will try to give access to some resource for the, the, his party, it's different than to receive a, 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 a representative and receiving on a monthly basis an amount of money, and nobody explains from where comes this money? So this was the first step was Mensalão. Certainly, corruption in Brazil is an ancient practice. Nominations for government's posts in exchange of political support also. However, the misdeeds in the past were either individual acts or a mix of patronage with leniency, not a fundamental mechanism for a government to gain and retain power. So we are facing a different kind of problem. Not as in the past, 
Sometimes people say, well, probably New York government corruption was there. Certainly, certainly, but not, I was not informed, I was not in favor, and this was not the base in which my government was uh, sustained. Certainly, you know, since the ancient Gre Greece, corruption is there as a, a personal misconduct uh, without the benediction from, from, from government and without having, having as target, as aim, to finance the whole political system. Well, however, the business in the past were either individual or, as I said, not to retain power. After Men Salam, corruption continued as if nothing had happened, reaching an all-encompassing level 10 years later with the so-called Petrolon, the scandal initially centered on Petrobras. What is the difference? In the, in the case of Ben Salon, there still are some doubts about, well, from where come the money? In the case of Petrolon, which was the, the, the corruption in Petrobras and the, the, the communication of this corruption with the political system, certainly the, came, the money comes from the state because Petro, uh, Petrobras is a public company. So the, the, the main instrument to finance parties came for the increasing of contracts by government or in a coalition between government and companies and political parties to give more money to, to one contract. Instead of having 100, let's put 120. The difference is to end through uh, political parties goes directly to the to, to finance pa uh, party system. Eventually, some either bureaucrat or uh, political agent takes some money for himself. But it's more serious than that, because it's the base of the political finan financing. is coming fr from that time on directly from public sources. This is Petrolon. Well, I would say that it is in a dis distortion of Gramsci's idea of hegemony, the blind am ambition to hold power for as long as possible, paved the way for ideological justification of the illegal financing of the workers' parties and their so-called allied parties. So this was possible, not just because there is lenience uh, and the tradition in, in Brazilian culture, but also because this idea, well, we are in power, we have to keep power, only we are capable to, 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 to do the good for people. So we have good reasons. We, we, well, like the, the old uh, leftist party in the past, they expropriate uh, the uh, rich people. So now we are reaching Brazil, the government. So let's propitiate the government and uh, redistribute among ourselves. So this was the, the, the instrument with some, some degrees of rationalization and justification in the name of political objectives, not, 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 not in, in, the, in the name of personal you know, progress. Uh, and this endeavor was facilitated by the expansion of the, of the economy and the fraudulent manipulation of state funds. The government ensured a steady supply of cheap public credit to national companies investing in Latin America, Africa, so, and eventually globally. This created a web of complicity between important sectors of the Brazilian economy and the parties in power. The interconnection, not to say con connivence, between public and private interests was accepted by society at large. Rulers, programs of social inclusion, somehow granted a kind of urb et orb absolution to any transgression, at least for a while. So it's a complex system. To have uh, elements to justify, to rationalize, uh, is not mere corruption, if corruption is mere. But then how? It's not mere corruption. More than that, it is the, the grand error of our country, which is at stake. So correct people will be more convinced that this is an instrument for the, for the goodness of people, because you are good, you are trying to, to get uh, some money, etc. The proliferation of political parties, the transformation of electoral campaigns in a costly show business, the personal corruption of political ag agents, the complicity of public and private companies ultimately led to the endless series of scandals denounced by the judiciary and the media. Some argue that the use of slush fund and, uh, and uh, uh, sorry, and then the, the, the cover second cash account to finance electoral campaigns allowing candidates and parties to receive funds non-declared to the electoral justice 
was a common practice. Common practice, perhaps, but cannot ge be generalized. What is new is not only the amount of funds received, both as com campaign donation and as money illegally diverted from contract with the public sector. What is new is the dissemination of this system throughout the public sector and the involvement of the top members of the federal government in the organization and spread, in its organization spread. To give an example, in the last electoral campaign, only one company gave $100 million, legally, legally, to all parties, or almost to all parties. This is not uh, a, a constructor uh, build, uh, a, a constructor company. Is a, 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 a meat processor and, uh, and exporter. One hundred million dollars for, for legally, apart from the, the Ill illegal, and for all parties. I know in one case, uh, uh, one person was candidate for the president, not for my party, and this person refused to receive. They put the, the, the amount of money in their uh, account. <laughs> and the party was forced to well, say, no, I don't want. So the, the basis for the, the financing of the, the, pub, pub, the political system in Brazil is in itself corrupt, because there is no uh, restriction. Can we, it's possible to give money to all the parties. We are not taking, you know, I'm supporting this because I coincide with their ideas. No, no, no. I'm, I'm paying because in the future I'm, I have a safeguard. Huh? So, uh, it, in, in the, not, 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 don't imagine you that it was the number one in terms of donation. No, no. Uh, altogether, I don't know exactly how much it, it cost an electoral campaign in our days. I can say what it was in my time. When I was president by the second time, uh, the, 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 the overall cost of the campaign was 44 uh, million reais, which correspond to more or less, uh, not one by one. Maybe, maybe let's put 40, 40 mi million dollars. Now we are speaking about one billion dollars. It's, a, it's a, some crazy situation. Well, you know, uh, in, let's just say, and this has been done not only for parties in government who are supporting government, for all parties, including oppositional parties, including people from my own party, are uh, facing difficult moments because this was a system. That's why I, I said, let me, I'm not a practitioner, let me make some sociological considerations and not accusations because it's difficult and you have to, to, be, to qualify who, who took the money, what for, how much, uh, what was the instrument? What for the campaign? They have uh, this guy put on the, the, in the pocket or not? There are lots of qualifications. I don't want to go in, enter. It is, a, it is a proper for the judicial system. The system was like that. Imposed this kind of is the corruption of a system, a, a part of the corruption of people is the corruption of a system. Well, well, you know, several top leaders of the workers' party are in jail, and mm -hmm. several more are either free on bail or await, waiting at a trial. And as I said, note that the accused do not belong only to the PT. Leaders of almost all parties, including some from the opposition to the previous government, as in the case of my own party, are experiencing the same predicament. From the standpoint of society, the impact of these malpractices is perceived as a moral disaster. People perceive parties and politicians as being involved in corruption and responsible for the inefficiency of the public services. This gives rise to an overall reaction of indignation and more, than oft, more, often than, more often than not, an attitude of cynicism regarding public life. The moral question, which seemed to be a concern of the educated middle class, has now become a concern of people at large. Well, it's time to conclude. the interconnection between the access to information and the demands for transparency and accountability will probably lead to substantive improvements in our democratic e e experience. Brazilian institutions 
have proved their resiliency. The federal police, the general attorney, and the judiciary are acting with the autonomy and independence granted by the Constitution. Let me tell you a discussion we had uh, and during the constitutional period. It was extremely difficult to introduce the idea of an autonomous system of uh, 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 attorneys. Attorneys were submitted to the so-called uh, general uh, advocate of the, of the republic in the hands of the government. So we decided to put apart. The government has some uh, body of, of, of lawyers defending its in interests. But uh, attorneys are in another position. They are there in order to defend its societal interests and in the name of the law. So this was very important. Uh, uh, the consequence of, of a, a new constitution take time to, to mature. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are now seeing the importance of that. So now we have a, a, an independent judicial court. And we are beginning to see attempts uh, uh, from the standpoint of the police to also be considered as an independent body inside government. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for the, in, the traditional Brazilian culture to understand how is it possible that the police, the federal police, will be independent from the president, or the general attorney independent from the president? This is a, is a, is a quite a, a, a cultural change. This is occurring in, in Brazil. And society is also being, you know, to a large extent, contaminated by these new forms of action. But the first time in my life, it's difficult for me to, I see in, in a, a demonstration, for the military demonstration, the police being uploaded. My God, it's a disaster because of that, because the police is behaving in a different way, we suppose. I, mean, I, I still have my doubts, you know. <laughs> and now, younger judges and prosecutors are well equipped to, to use the new legal dispositions su such as the plea bargain to foster their investigations. These are novelties, uh, novelties too. It, it, these are uh, instruments coming not from our tradition, uh, Italian Germanic uh, uh, law. This comes from Anglo Saxon law. So this is being absorbed by the Brazilian system. We are, in Brazil, signatory of the international conventions to fight organized crime, especially tax evasion and money laundering. The exchange of information with other countries has also helped to disclose crimes of corruption and bribery that in the past would have remained undetected. Let me give one more example of how things have changed for the best despite the complexity of the present crisis. In the past, confronted with a crisis like the current one, we, Brazilians, would be speculating about the attitude of the four-star generals. Today, most of all of us do not even know their names while the names of the 11 justices of the Supreme Court are household names. This is a profound modification. Since I am old, I remember in old time, since my, 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 my father was also a general, my grandfather was a, a, a field marshal, so I, I, I have this sense of the, of the transformation. Uh, in the past, we were speculating about who will be the new leader, the military, no doubts about. Who is the commander in chief in Sao Paulo? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, who is in Rio? Who is the, nobody knows. But we know the name of, the, of the, 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 the justice. Even if you go to criticize some of them, we know their non names. This was a transformation. Huh? Uh, and so the Supreme Court, as a guardian of the Constitution, has the final decision. It decides, and that's it. Well. There are some dangers in that, in, 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 in that situation, too. The Supreme Court has problems, too. Well, I don't want to make criticism abroad uh, on this, the Supreme, Brazilian Supreme Court, uh, but uh, I, I read a recent uh, article by uh, um, a, a, a lawyer from the Fundación Getúlio Vargas in Sao Paulo. It's a very good uh, article uh, stressing some problems uh, inside the Supreme Court. But anyhow, it's better to have problems to adjudge the Supreme Court, they, they problems to put in, in the, the military you know, aside. It's much better to deal with the Supreme Court. Wow. 
and the means of communication, mainstream and social media, are fulfilling their role. They anticipate what's going to happen. They criticize any and all acts of corruption or threats of the democratic process Brazil, Brazilian enjoys. Now, the point is that the Brazil, Brazil enjoys a full freedom of the press. No doubt about that. Of course, govern, government and parties dislike and criticize the media. Well, I did the same when I was in the presidency. It's enough to read my diaries. I was against you. Oh my God, what this, this guy is distorting my, what I said. It's not, to, it's not correct. This is, is part of the game. Uh, we cannot uh, imagine a president being uh, conformist with the criticism came from the media. But the important thing is that the, the criticism has to be preserved and to be very, very, very lively. We have this, this kind of criticism. Someone says, oh, it's too much. Maybe from the point of view of those in power, it's always too much. Uh, but from the point of view of society, it's important to open doors. It's important to put clear, more clearly what's going on. So I think this uh, is also a pillar of uh, what is going on in Brazil. We have the judiciary system. We have free press. We have even the police who, uh, behaving more in a, in, under the law. And uh, <laughs> institutions are working, are working. Even the parliament. The parliament is, is, is criticized, so on and so forth, but, the, but it's, it's producing law. I would say. Uh, if we take into account what happened in the, in the last year in Brazil, by a president who has minimum levels of popularity, I don't know, three, four percent. Uh, but the Congress is delivering, including some very difficult decisions. For instance, you know, the, Brazil, the, the, the union system in Brazil was created uh, by Vargas and is based in a kind of permanent relationship between government and unions. Now, step by step, the unions are more independent, but the money comes from fiscal money. Everybody, uh, the Brazilians have to pay one day per year to, 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 to sustain unions. Well, the Congress decides that it's not no more, it will be no more like that. So this will produce a, a tremendous transformation in the, in, in the union system. I am in favor, of course, to keep system, the unions who, who, uh, act, uh, alive, but it's necessary to see what kind of union. The same, pro the same process I described in the creation of new parties is occurring in the creation of the new unions in Brazil. We have more than 10,000 unions. UK has less than 200. Why we have 10,000 unions? Because they are effectively defending the, the labor, no, because they receive money. Mm -hmm. So this is al al almost uh, to finish. So the institutions are working. To say and to conclude, uh, the point is the algorithms of politics has changed it because of the transformations. It is time to rewave the threads between society and politics, seats in action and representative democracy. Demos and res publica. That is our problem, but not my problem, it's our problem. Uh, so that is what is used to, 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 to call uh, the, the uh, crisis in, in democracy, which is much more than a crisis in democracy, a transformation in society. And suddenly we discovered that our forms of de uh, de uh, representative democracy have been based on, well, pastoral at least, corruption and bad practice. And then you would don't want anymore to follow the same path. I think it's a good moment to force for, for new days. Thank you.
We don't have to have a panel. Yeah, that's what I was just saying. <laughs> just say that. Thank well, you. I, I, then I believe. I oh, you're you, but kidding me. No, it's okay. Yeah. He's uh, he's from Mexico. Okay. He's a board member. He's going to be really good. He he knows what to do. Just just introduce him and let him talk. Okay. Well, no, I'm not doing that. Well, you asked me to do a conversation, so that's what I'm planning to do. Okay. okay. I'll um, just 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 ask him a general question about, okay. about yeah. Mexico. Um, uh, I'll figure something out. Yeah. Thanks. It's, Daniel Sabato. Thank you. Mucho gusto. I'm going to do it in Spanish. Okay, then I better get my. Because uh, believe it or not, I don't speak. You don't speak Spanish. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, this I, is a very I good thought moment about to it, start. but yeah, I, I'm more comfortable in Spanish. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Yo lo pensé y más lo tengo preparado en los dos idiomas, pero al final no, es esto es. Mejor lo hago en español porque son 15 minutos. Este, después entonces uno no. Eh, tú manejas, tú, tú lo pones cuando me tocas. No, yo no tengo el. Sí, vamos a necesitar eso, ¿no? Gracias. Salvamos el, salvamos la crisis a último momento. Waiting for one last person. So while we're uh, gathering and settling ourselves, I'd like to say in part. After that opening address, I'm not sure we even need this panel. <laughs> so um, we will, and we're also a bit over time, so we're going to shorten this one just a little bit. We also have two unexpected people on the panel. One of them is Rafael, who's just arriving, and the other is myself. So bear with us. This is... Um, uh, you know, um, how things happen in Washington. We also have lost Maria Amparo Cesar, um, who uh, Rafael is, is replacing. She's had a family emergency. Her expertise would have been critical to the panel. Um, so we're sorry to lose her, and our hearts are with her. Let me very briefly introduce panel members. Everyone has uh, bios. Um, starting with Margarita, are you teaching currently in uh, Venezuela? No, I'm a retired professor. Okay, now. all right. I F from the uh, Center for Development Studies, but with m most today, today, I'm also in the Catholic University as a member of the Technical Commission. Okay, super. Uh, next to her is Daniel Zovato for the from the International Institute. I'm not going to use IDEA because ideas are so great, but 
you know, there are lots of them, right? So the International Institute for uh, Democracy and Electoral Assistance. Um, Rafael is director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies um, and also teaches global policy and strategy at the University of California, San Diego. I am uh, not a Latin Americanist. I'm a corruptionist. Also, I plead um, to not being a practitioner. Um, uh, senior fellow in the Democracy and Rule of Law program at um, uh, the Carnegie Endowment. I've done some recent work in Central America in particular. And over here you have Arturo Valenzuela, Covington and Burling, and previously assistant, assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs and also on the National Security Staff. So what, why is that doing that? Um, what I'd really like to do is make this as much of a conversation as possible. So I'm hoping that uh, no one, that is, was the guidance that I was given and I hope no one has prepared statements. If you have, figure out how to get your message into the questions that I've asked uh, that I'm going to be asking you. So I'd like to start by saying, you know, it's not just Brazil that's suffering from a moral crisis. You know, uh, the president was showing how Brazil fit in with some massive global transformations and then said, but Brazil has this speci sorry, specificity, which is the moral crisis. Uh, it seems to me that the very same moral crisis of systemic corruption is a um, really significant global issue. And you just have to look at South Korea, at Lebanon, at, you know, um, Guatemala, at, at even the rise of, of um, uh, religious extremism in some cases can be traced to the same indignation that the president was describing to us. Now, that being said, um, and the sort of systemic networked nature of the corruption phenomenon, again, not personal misconduct, but rather the operating system of very sophisticated networks that are interweaving sectors that may uh, you know, seem to be distinct, like public sector, private sector, out and out criminals, we find them to be fully braided together in kleptocratic networks. Now, within this global context, Latin America is certainly the probably the region where there is the most effervescence in response to it. So a question, and I think, Daniel, I'd like to put this to you first, but for every question, I'd love if anyone else has, a, has thoughts with respect to it, dive in. Um, in the past, the way we've tended to think about Latin America politically has really focused on the right-left divide, right? I mean, that was the dominant way of understanding what what the political oppositions are and, 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 and how politics was playing out. And yet, this corruption phenomenon seems to be crossing those boundaries with great alacrity. And, you know, Brazil is an obvious case. Um, look at Arena's Tony Saca in El Salvador, and then Fuenes, you know, I mean, is, is this phenomenon upending the sort of right-left construct for understanding Latin American politics? En primer lugar, eh, más allá de si el debate en torno a izquierda-derecha es un debate que ha concluido en la región o no, sí claramente en materia de corrupción, la corrupción hoy está afectando tanto a los partidos presidentes o expresidentes de izquierda como de derecha. Por eso de derecha como de izquierda. Por eso la, la reciente afirmación del de expresidente Correa en una conferencia que dio en Colombia hace una semana atrás, cuando dijo que el tema de la corrupción era una estrategia para ir detrás de los gobiernos progresistas, o la reciente entrevista que acaba de dar Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, publicada en La Nación ayer o de hoy, donde señala lo mismo, eh, es totalmente inválido. Es decir, eh, yo me podría dedicar los próximos 15 minutos que me asignaron para conversar en, originalmente en darle a ustedes la lista detallada, no de políticos de tercer y cuarto nivel o de empresarios de tercer y cuarto nivel, sino de presidentes, expresidentes, vicepresidentes, etc. 
Entonces, ese es un primer punto que tenemos que tomar en cuenta. Ahora, me gustaría dejar planteado desde el inicio en esta mesa qué es lo nuevo respecto de este fenómeno. Y para mí hay tres cosas que, que creo que tenemos que ponerle particular atención. Uno es que, si bien el tema de corrupción en América Latina no es nuevo, sí hoy tiene características totalmente diferentes al pasado. Estamos hablando de la gran corrupción, estamos hablando de un sistema mucho más complejo, mucho más sofisticado. En segundo lugar, se está produciendo una combinación donde se están alineando los planetas para estar viendo los resultados que estamos viendo hoy. ¿Qué quiere decir esto? Gran parte de lo que decía el presidente Cardoso. Tenemos la irrupción de nuevas clases medias y ahí hay que conectar el tema de la, del fenómeno de la corrupción con el proceso profundo de transformación social que ha vivido y sigue viviendo América Latina en los últimos 20 años. Hemos sacado 60, 70 millones de gente de la pobreza y le hemos pasado a la clase media y hay una nueva agenda de clase media donde el tema de la corrupción, la tolerancia frente a la corrupción ha ido aumentando. Es decir, cada vez hay más repudio frente a la, a, la, a la corrupción, cada vez hay menos tolerancia, cada vez hay mayor demanda de transparencia. Ese es un tema que llegó para quedarse. Y siento por primera vez que el tema de la corrupción comienza a los latinoamericanos y a las latinoamericanas a darnos vergüenza, lo cual es un cambio tremendamente positivo desde el punto de vista cultural. El roba pero hace ya no es gratuito. Si a eso le agregamos el tema del boom de los commodities, del tema de las redes sociales, del tema de las movilizaciones, de la sociedad civil, etc., tenemos ahí un componente que hace a este fenómeno completamente diferente. Y en tercer lugar, esto obliga a un tema en el cual yo he venido trabajando mucho tiempo y durante mucho tiempo fracasé, y hoy celebro que estemos, que es vincular la agenda anticorrupción con tráfico de influencia y conflicto de interés con el tema del financiamiento de la política. Estas eran dos cosas que venían separadas. Estudiamos financiamiento de campañas por este lado y trabajamos los temas de recusión por este lado. El caso de Brasil, pero no solamente el de Brasil, el caso de, de Chile, el caso de Argentina y muchos otros, el caso de Guatemala, demuestra la interconexión y cómo tenemos que tener un nuevo enfoque, una mirada mucho más holística, un concepto de integridad donde el tema financiamiento político con el tema corrupción, tráfico de influencia y conflicto de interés están relacionados. Y con un elemento que me gustaría agregar a la excelente conferencia que nos tiene acostumbrado el presidente Cardoso. El tema de Odebrecht y el tema de financiamiento, ese, ese sistema inductor de corrupción diseñado con una gran proliferación de partidos políticos, tuvo en América Latina algo totalmente novedoso. Odebrecht exportó no solamente infraestructura de muy buena calidad, sino que Odebrecht a través de la, de, de, del del apoyo del partido político fundamentalmente el PT y en algunos casos, quizás con Lula, puso a disposición de presidentes de derecha y de izquierda, de derecha como Martinelli, de izquierda como Mala y otros, a un gran publicista que es Joao Santana. Y entonces Odebrecht financió campañas políticas en más de 11 países poniendo un publicista que le permitía a esos presidentes, en la mayoría de los casos, ganar las elecciones y después venía el momento de cobrar. Entonces, este otro fenómeno de la regionalización de la corrupción yeah. nos obliga a tener una mirada. And we'll get to that in a second. That's really an important uh, phenomenon because it's not just in the region. Correct. It's transnational. <coughs> Margarita, I think you had. Sí, yo quería referirme al, a, a esta división entre derecha e izquierda porque creo que sí hay algún elemento que es importante reconocer en gobiernos de izquierda. Por cierto, que yo. Estoy, voy a, o sea, mi, mi experticia es sobre Venezuela y de alguna manera el, el caso de Venezuela es tan extremo que se sale un poco de, estos lugar, de estas cosas comunes que tiene la sí. región e incluso eh, eh, con estos visos de optimismo. ¿no? Y lo primero que quería decir es que la cultura de izquierda, por lo menos en mi país, una parte de esa cultura de izquierda fue profundamente antiliberal y eso ha producido que en, este, en el, los 18 años del régimen chavista se usó una retórica antidemocracia representativa que permitió este, ahondar en la destrucción de las instituciones de contrapeso entre los poderes públicos. Y eso, digamos, yo creo que sí es una diferencia con la derecha. O sea, que el, el, en el momento en que se utiliza una retórica de izquierda extrema, como fue el caso del populismo chavista, 
se, se viene acompañado con un, con un discurso antiliberal y antidemocracia representativa y eso permitió el socavamiento a los ya débiles contrapesos institucionales que tenía el petroestado. Otro, otro, otra cosa que por cierto también lo dijo en su clase, en su presentación magistral el presidente Fernando Enrique Cardoso, fue que además había, hay, hay en el proyecto populista, chavista, de izquierda, un profundo rechazo a la alternancia política. O sea, una vez que uno llega al poder, uno es el bueno y uno es el que se tiene que quedar. Y eso socava aún más las posibilidades, digamos, de una construcción democrática. Porque, y si hay algo en este momento difícil en Venezuela, es una mesa de negociación donde el gobierno esté dispuesto a negociar una salida, porque el, el gobierno no tiene en su ADN la idea de la alternancia política, eso no existe allí. Entonces no está convencido que tenga necesidad de irse. Entonces eso, eso nos agrava aún más la situación. Es una idea de quedarse como, 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 como para siempre. Dicho esto, quiero mencionar que también me parece que la corrupción es distinta actualmente de lo que era en el pasado, pero es distinta en el caso de Venezuela a lo que se han dicho aquí de otros países. ¿En qué sentido lo digo? ¿Que la clase media en Venezuela tiene más conciencia de eso? No estoy segura. Lo tuvo antes sobre la corrupción. Pero creo que en Venezuela el, el, la forma de ejercicio del poder que, que, que deja como herencia el, 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 el carisma del presidente Chávez es un tipo de ejercicio de poder, es un tipo de dominación patrimonial, tradicional patrimonial en buen lenguaje weberiano. Es decir, que una vez que desaparece el líder carismático, él con su dedo señala a su sucesor en una suerte pues, de, 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 de derivado casi religioso y esa casta que está allí tiene derecho a gobernar por derecho propio. Y entonces no es un régimen burocrático, weberiano, racional, legal. Es un régimen tradicional patrimonial. Es decir, aquí se gobierna en Venezuela porque nosotros tenemos derecho a gobernar, porque somos los hijos de Chávez, porque somos los discípulos, los que lo conocimos y los que, y los que interpretamos su legado. Y a partir de allí las relaciones son de lealtad y de afecto. Y siendo un régimen no moderno, no legal y no racional, el gobierno se reparte entre las familias del chavismo, entre los colegas militares del chavismo, que fragmentan y utilizan el Estado y se lo reparten para sus beneficios personales. Yo este, puedo ahondar un poco más en eso, yo lo traía preparado para mostrar lo que es el nepotismo en Venezuela. Para poner, pero voy a poner un ejemplito para poder seguir conversando, porque es que no, no me lo puedo guardar. En la casa presidencial de Venezuela todavía están los hijos de Chávez. Eso es así, como si Chelsea Clinton todavía estuviera en la Casa Blanca, negada, ¿verdad? Bueno, well, le... uh, uh, Chelsea Clinton, ¿qué es Ivanka Trump? Bueno, ahí está, es como también, es como si estuviese eso, ¿no? Este, la familia de Obama se hubiera negado a salir de la Casa Blanca. Es más, la información que yo tengo es que se dividen entre ellos, se han dividido, se han hecho anexos en la casona para que puedan cada uno vivir su vida privada allí. Este, puedo, la fortuna de la familia de Chávez sobrepasa los 500 millones de dólares. La mamá tiene una mansión en Fort Lauderdale. Y, y, y puedo continuar, pero voy a dejarlo allí, pero en el sentido de que el nepotismo forma parte del sistema. No hay una cultura del escándalo en Venezuela sobre eso. Los, los que nos escandalizamos somos los de siempre pero para los otros eso se ha vuelto algo normal en el poder, porque es un poder neopatrimonial. I think, um, I, I agree that Venezuela is, I mean, uh, I've chosen not to work on Venezuela <laughs> because I think it's so far out that it's almost, you know, not a representative example of, of uh, what's going on worldwide. On the other hand, the kind of nepotism you're talking about, of course, for it to jump generations like this, political generations, I mean, is rather remarkable, but, you know, I think, Uh, President Aliyev of uh, Azerbaijan just named his wife to be his vice president. 
um, uh, Gulnora. You don't have to go to Azerbaijan. You can go to Nicaragua. <laughs> or Nicaragua. Right. <laughs> right. It's, it's near. Yeah. It's near. Yeah. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's a global phenomenon. It's j let's not just blame Latin America here. You're right. You're right. You can <laughs> find this in the region, but you can also go, you know, a few miles north and find it here. So we're looking at the kind of um, clanification of politics <laughs> in a lot of places. But I would still like to push a little bit deeper on the right left distinction that we like to make. I was gonna go to Arturo, but that, let, let, let me grab you afterwards, because what I wanted to actually probe is the degree to which we don't have a, a, such an overlap in a number of countries between the private sector, uh, kind of captains of industry, and their public sector network partners, if you will, that you get a kind of legalizing of corruption under ostensibly very democratic systems. I mean, do you, do you, I mean, is this big distinction between checks and balances in a more, in a, in a less leftist uh, context and the effective defanging of those checks and balances under a lot of ostensible democracies. I, is that what we're watching? Look, um, and, and should I answer in Spanish or in any? Whatever. In, in, <laughs> whatever you want. Eh, eh, yo, yo creo, francamente, que es un error destacar demasiado el tema del populismo de izquierda o del populismo de derecha, porque tenemos, porque tenemos populismos de derecha y de izquierda. Right. ¿ah? Y la clave en, el sen, en ese sentido es que los populismos son populismos. ¿ah? ¿Y cómo se define el populismo? ¿Ah? Hacer lo que uno tiene que hacer para poder mantenerse popular ¿ah? y mantenerse en el poder. ¿ah? Y eso podría ser una... Y hay ejemplos, y no los voy a mencionar todos, pero hay ejemplos en América Latina de derechas y izquierdas que también son populistas. Y el problema con el populismo es que es antisistémico, porque lo que quiere el, 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 el populista es mantenerse en el poder y nada más. ¿ah? Cambia las reglas si es necesario. ¿Ah? Si están subiendo los precios, hay que congelar los precios. ¿Ah? Si hay un problema con las exportaciones, hay que congelar las exportaciones. Todo lo que uno necesite para mantenerse en el poder. Ahora, yo quisiera profundizar un tema, eh, eh, si, si me permiten. Estamos frente, a mi juicio, todavía con el gran tema de la consolidación de la democracia en América Latina. Eh, eh, tenemos que acordarnos que, que en América Latina, este, entre los años 30 y los años 80, un 42% de todos los cambios de gobierno fueron por golpe de Estado. Tenemos que acordarnos también de que tuvimos, desde nuestros años 60, 70 y 80, solamente tres países ¿ah? se escapan, digamos, el, el, el autoritarismo militar de esa época. Estamos frente en ese sentido a, eh, a una, un proceso todavía de consolidación de instituciones democráticas que son frágiles en muchas partes. De hecho, los países que tienen menos niveles de corrupción son los países que tienen también una larga trayectoria democrática. O sea, la democracia en sí contribuye a la consolidación de procesos, digamos, de Estado de Derecho. Y eso es bien importante, acord acordarnos de eso, pero encima de eso tenemos... Que en la brillante exposición del presidente Cardoso, o mi profesor Cardoso, mejor, este, en este caso, eh, eh, tenemos también todos los cambios de la globalización que están ocurriendo. ¿eh? Y, y el hecho de que la globalización y el, incluso la corrupción es un sistema ahora internacional. ¿eh? Eh, está el tema de, de, de la globalización, globalización heureuse y la malheureuse, ¿eh? que efectivamente afecta a distinta gente de distintas formas. Así que es ahí donde tenemos que volver a hablar un poco sobre, y esto también está una parte central de la, de, la, de la presentación del presidente Cardoso, de los 18 presidentes, por ejemplo, que no han terminado, ¿ah? y solamente dos por golpe de Estado, Aristide y Zelaya, ¿ah? clásicos, digamos, han, 18 presidentes, sin embargo, no terminaron. Hay un problema de gobernabilidad en América Latina. ¿ah? Y, y, y en ese sentido, y termino con esto, destaco el, el hecho de que gran parte de los problemas que hemos tenido con estos 18 presidentes que no han terminado y presidentas que no han terminado ha sido el hecho de que efectivamente el sistema presidencial con la separación de poderes eh, eh, ha llevado a una situación donde hasta cierto punto presidentes minoritarios se tienen que comprar, digamos las cosas como son, se tienen que comprar el parlamento. Entonces al comprar el parlamento, eh, ¿qué usan para comprar el parlamento? 
buscan a sectores del sector privado, que, entonces eso crea hasta este, este monstruo, uh, efectivamente. Así que tenemos que volver a los temas tuyos, Daniel, ¿eh? Eh, financiamiento de la política, pero también sistemas electorales, también reformas del sistema de partidos políticos, y tenemos que... Uh, Ver también que las instituciones como tal, el presidencialismo en América Latina como hasta esta, es un sistema que efectivamente no está funcionando bien. Uh, and Rafael had Thank you. some input on this. Thank you. Uh, uh, me da mucho gusto, de, mucha alegría estar en este 40 aniversario y déjenme, este, a ver, Sara, hay tres grandes problemas en América Latina. Los tres grandes obstáculos para nuestro bienestar es Claramente eh, eh, tenemos el problema de la violencia, tenemos el problema de la injusticia social, la pésima destrucción del ingreso y tenemos el problema de la corrupción. Yo diría el problema más apremiante es la corrupción, es el problema realmente que nos deprime, que nos enoja y que en mi país, en México, es central en este momento y va a ser central en la elección del año que entra. El tema realmente del terremoto de la reacción a los terremotos en México de la semana pasada y las semanas anteriores, porque no solamente fue en la Ciudad de México, sino también en Oaxaca y en el estado de Chiapas, o sea, es una devastación muy grande, es central el tema de la anticorrupción. Eh, ¿Qué se hizo, por ejemplo? Bueno, algo a través de, de las redes sociales, se le está imponiendo a los partidos políticos disminuir su presupuesto. El presupuesto público que tienen es de casi mil millones de dólares, 0.9 billion dollars, es la cifra, es enorme. Entonces, ya salió el PRI a decir que va a disminuir, pero yo diría, ahora bien, ¿qué se rompió en México? ¿Por qué la corrupción, en el, en el, yo diría, hace dos o tres años se volvió realmente lo que más nos molesta a los mexicanos? En cualquier encuesta de opinión está ahí. Yo diría que hubo una especie de tormenta perfecta en el segundo o tercer año de gobierno, porque hubo tres casos de corrupción fuertísimos que llegaron incluso a la figura presidencial, sobre todo a la primera dama presidencial, la famosa Casa Blanca, una compra de una casa en las lomas de Chapultepec de 8 millones de dólares, aparentemente un regalo de Televisa, algo muy raro que nunca se explicó, y, y otras dos cosas más, y hubo una tormenta perfecta. Además, diría yo, lo que también sucedió es que los mexicanos decíamos, en Brasil sí pasan cosas, en el vecino Guatemala sí pasan cosas, ya sacaron a Otto Pérez Molina, ya sacaron, o sea, el, el, el problema, digamos, de la, de la corrupción en la famosa línea, en el, el problema este, digamos, de las aduanas, pues acabó con todo y en México no pasaba nada. Y lo que realmente eh, pasó en México, Daniel, eh, eh, Arturo y tú, Margarita, y me parece que ese es un tema muy de América Latina, pero muy característico de México, es que la sociedad civil organizada salió como nunca en la historia de México, al menos, van a decir, algo tenemos que hacer en contra de la corrupción. Y hay una ley muy importante de julio de 2016, que es el Acta Nacional Anticorrupción, que es muy compleja, pero que sí realmente, si se logra realmente plasmar, si se logra concretar, realmente puede cambiar las cosas. Lo que hace esta ley es, es crea, digamos, es, es muy compleja, pero crea tres cosas muy importantes. Primero, crea un eh, comité ciudadano, hay cinco ciudadanos elegidos de, de una manera, digamos, eh, una selección bastante bien hecha, que realmente van a ser, digamos, los jefes, de la, eh, son el comité, digamos, que va a observar todo. También se está creando un fiscal anticorrupción y un fiscal general. El fiscal anticorrupción va a ser una figura muy importante, con mucha independencia, pero tendría que haber sido nombrado en 2014 y no se han puesto de acuerdo en cómo nombrarlo. No es fácil la cosa. Tampoco se ha podido, y el, 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 digamos, el Procurador General de Justicia, el Attorney General, cambia por un fiscal general y tampoco se ha podido nombrar. Entonces, hay una discusión enorme en México, pero sí algo pasó ahí y es la sociedad civil organizada la que dijo, ya basta, nunca lo habíamos visto así, hicieron un cabildeo tremendo ante el Congreso, realmente ha sido, y también, digamos, es muy interesante ver la respuesta del Estado, por ejemplo, hay una acusación muy fuerte, este, algo que reveló el New York Times, que justamente, que bueno, el gobierno contrató una compañía israelita, Pegasus, para poder, digamos, observar los celulares de muchos de estos líderes eh, civiles en México. Entonces, realmente hay algo... Muy fuerte en México, me parece que el tema número uno 
en la elección del año que entra. Tenemos una elección importantísima el año que entra, en julio próximo, porque va a ser la elección, yo diría, más importante en la historia de México, porque no solamente va a estar en juego la presidencia y el Congreso, sino 30 de los 32 estados va a haber algún tipo de elección. Entonces va a ser enorme, y ya lo verán ustedes, central va a ser en esto. Entonces, insisto, sí me parece, digamos, que los tres problemas de América Latina, el que ahorita nos convoca, el que realmente nos deprime y nos enoja es la corrupción, y ahí vemos una ciudad, una sociedad organizada muy fuerte. El caso de Guatemala, por ejemplo, fue fantástico, Realmente, cómo salieron, a la, cómo tomaron la calle eh, y, y realmente, bueno, presionaron y cayó el gobierno de otros, Otto Pérez Molina. Ahí, digamos, me eh, parece, digamos, que en México ha sido interesante cómo se ha contenido la región eh, y, bueno, está un sistema de corrupción que si, que si se llega a concretar va a ser una respuesta muy satisfactoria, pero están justamente en eso, no está fácil la cosa, hay muchas resistencias y evidentemente hay un gobierno muy dividido y un presidencialismo, como bien dice Arturo Valenzuela, pues que no está siendo muy funcional en México. I mean, you point to these three problems. I would submit that they are related. That violence sometimes is one of the tools that corrupt networks can use. They often want to have informal instruments of force that they can, you know, that offer deniable, uh, um, I want to say almost punitive uh, capacities to them. And then once you do that, you're, you've kind of opened the doors to the sort of generalized violence that we see in a number of countries. The social exclusion or the inequalities are obviously a result of the type of rigged systems that we're looking at. And so, and, and it seems to me that a lot of, of the populations understand the relationships among these three. Um, uh, I wanted to, just because we are being asked to look historically a little bit, to pose one other historical question, and I think I'd like to go to you first, Margarita. Um, you know, a a and again, the president referred to this briefly, but colonial administrations were predicated on the extraction of resources for the benefit of the external power. I guess a question, and again, I'm, I'm posing this question in an international context because I've seen in a number of other post-colonial uh, countries that I've looked at very carefully, um, in some sense you have the adoption of the same system by post-colonial post elites who are often able to use anti-imperialist and anti-colonialist rhetoric to bind their populations to them while their own behavior may not be all that different from the behavior of the colonial powers. Is that a fair characterization at all? Sí, yo diría que es un poco más amplio que eso, sí, In, indudablemente que nosotros venimos de, de un proceso de colonizaje de más de tres siglos, donde no solamente había una extracción, ¿verdad?, de las materias primas para llevarlas al imperio, sino que había una tremenda ineficiencia de un gobierno muy centralizado que fue la corona española. Lo digo porque Venezuela fue una de las provincias que no era virreinato, que no, no tenía la, la administración importante, funcionariado, como el caso de México, o Perú o Colombia, sino que era una provincia en el Caribe, pues prácticamente montada en el Caribe, que tenía solamente iba a tener una capitanía a finales del periodo colonial. La ineficiencia obligaba a la corrupción, vamos a decirlo así, ¿no? Es un problema profundamente corrupto, porque bueno, yo este, mientras iba y volvía el permiso de Felipe II allá, este, pues se pasaban unos cuatro o cinco meses, quizás más, y, y posiblemente no llegaba bien la respuesta y había que volver a mandar para allá. Y entonces, en, en definitiva, se le pagaba al funcionario para resolver el problema. Pues. Y fue muy común durante la colonia, una frase que me recuerdo desde primaria, pero que me llamaba mucho la atención, que era que cuando llegaba una cosa, cuando llegaba una orden real y no había este, cómo cumplirla, se decía se ponía la orden aquí en la cabeza y decía, se acata, pero no se cumple. <risa> se acata, pero no se cumple. Es decir, bueno, 
no lo, no, hacemos lo que nos dé la gana, pues vamos a decirlo así. Entonces creo que hay una cultura eh, de ineficiencia por, por, por centralismo exacerbado, que fue la corona española en su, en su época, pasada pues a estos estados modernos latinoamericanos que pues, también han sido profundamente por el proceso de industrialización profundamente centralistas y que este, y se mantuvo soterrada el, el, el proceso de la, de, de, de la, cosa, de, de la cultura eh, eh, de corrupción. Este, pero yo diría que, 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 claro, hemos dado un salto, porque en el caso que vengo señalando, y me va a disculpar Arturo, pero voy a volver a decir que es un populismo de izquierda, porque quiero, digamos, un poco, creo que comul, comulgamos los nicaragüenses, los bolivianos, los ecuatorianos y los venezolanos en algunas de estas cosas que voy a decir. Este, la corrupción permitió la destrucción institucional y en el caso de Venezuela, quizás es más, es más severo, pero no el único, esas, ese es el terreno fértil en donde entró el crimen organizado transnacional. Y en Venezuela está el crimen organizado transnacional operando dentro del Estado. Y de, y de tal magnitud que tenemos al vicepresidente de la República Bolivariana de Venezuela en la lista OFAC, como traficante de droga, el vicepresidente de la República de Venezuela, acusado de, de, de lavar dinero, acusado de, de, de traficar hacia, hacia México y Honduras. Eh, eh, y tenemos al ministro de Relaciones Interiores, este, que fue el antizar de la droga en Venezuela entre el 2008 y el 2010, es decir, el jefe de la Oficina Nacional Antinarcótico, acusado de facilitar el tráfico de la cocaína, de cientos y cientos de kilos de cocaína, a través del territorio venezolano. Como ustedes saben, Venezuela en este momento es uno de los sitios de paso más importantes de la, de la cocaína eh, de la región. Y, este, y Venezuela es en este momento el país más corrupto de América Latina, eh, percibido como el más corrupto de acuerdo con Transparencia Internacional, está en el puesto 166 de 176 países, el más corrupto incluyendo este, Haití. O sea, Venezuela en este momento, Haití está en el puesto 158, nosotros estamos en el puesto 166. Entonces, allí, y yo diría que este, hay un ingrediente, la corrupción se, se, se permitió la entrada del, del crimen organizado transnacional y eso ha creado una situación de violencia generalizada en el país, donde usted no puede salir después de las seis de la tarde del país, porque no hay poder judicial, el poder judicial está arrodillado al Ejecutivo Nacional, este, pero sí campea el, el, el crimen. ¿no? Este, hay zonas de, del territorio, el Estado se está haciendo pedazos, ah, está caminando hacia su fragmentación, eh, 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 las cárceles están tomadas por jefes de cárceles, por lo que nosotros lo llamamos pranes, y el esquema del pran, que es el, 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 el criminal que organiza la cárcel y que tiene las armas y que, y que desde ahí hace sus propios negocios, se está extendiendo a otros terrenos como las minas de oro y de diamante en el sur del país. Quiero terminar diciendo lo siguiente, además, que por eso sigo hablando del populismo de izquierda, que yo creo que ya América Latina no se puede este, tomar como una región que tiene problemas comunes. Creo que, creo que en eso Sara tiene razón, este es un problema mundial. Este, Venezuela en este momento se alinea ¿verdad? con Rusia, con China, con Irán, con Corea del Norte. ¿no? Entonces son otras alianzas, que son alianzas que trascienden a América Latina y que de alguna manera también fragmentan a América Latina de, de dejar de ser una región con características parecidas, porque hay unos que están mirando al Pacífico, otros que siguen mirando por Europa o los Estados Unidos, en fin. Hay, yo creo que tenemos que complejizar mucho más eh, la relación. Y puedes terminar diciendo un comentario a lo que tú dijiste <ríe> sobre México. Y es que nosotros en los 80 y 90 nos escandalizábamos mucho por la corrupción que anidaba en el régimen de la democracia representativa liberal que tuvimos. Y el resultado de eso fue que fue desprestigiándose de tal manera la democracia representativa que abonamos el terreno para la emergencia del líder carismático. Y entonces, 
<risa> aunque salíamos a la calle, la clase media organizada, la sociedad civil, habían grandes movilizaciones de la sociedad civil pidiendo reformas más modernas, transparencia, que nos, este, una vida de bienestar urbano mejor, que nos sacaran el aeropuerto de la ciudad, recuerdo cosas así. Pero al final del día, cuando rompió el siglo XXI, emergimos con un populismo de izquierdas. <risa> y aquí estamos. <risa> Um, you, you wanna, yeah. Rafael? Es que me provocas, Margarita, porque... Bueno, a ver, yo me asusto. La, gran, me discus la gran discusión que hay ahorita en México es, este, digamos, o sea, tenemos una elección enfrente y justamente al, al candidato que va hasta adelante, el caballo blanco, que es Andrés Manuel López Obrador, que por mucho va arriba de todos los sondeos, este, claramente, digamos, es, es, es una gente que está polarizando enormemente a México, pero digamos, cuando volteamos a ver la polarización de Estados Unidos en nuestro país y en nuestros países, se está pasando esta polarización. A mí me parece la polarización de Brasil enorme, es o Lula en contra de Lula, y en México es, digo, las élites ya hicieron a Andrés Manuel López Obrador alguien peor que Hugo Chávez. Es, es increíble, el otro día lo comento en una... Eh, en una reunión alguien me decía que prefería que el gobernador Duarte, que es un gobernador que, bueno, se llevó hasta las sillas del gobierno de Veracruz, es increíble la corrupción y la matanza y demás, este, que decía que, que prefería que Duarte fuera el presidente a que fuera el observador. Es decir, las élites ya lo pintaron al observador de alguien peor que Hugo Chávez y por otro lado tienes a los seguidores del López Obrador soportando lo que sea y diciéndole cualquier cosa menos las élites. Entonces, hay una polarización muy fuerte eh, y realmente tú ves a, a López Obrador posesionándose con el tema de el, 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 el anuncio que tiene televisivo es increíble, digamos, la violencia verbal que usa, rateros, ladrones, hablándole al gobierno, pero por otro lado, digamos, le está hablando, es un, es un anuncio que hicieron claramente con muchos focus groups y con mucha digamos, este, e, e, inteligencia atrás, porque claramente la gente está muy molesta por lo que ha pasado en este sexenio. Entonces, sí es un tema enormemente divisivo, es un tema, digamos, en que, en que sí, digamos, la más o menos izquierda está arremetiendo contra el PRI, porque sí hay que decirlo, eh, es increíble, digamos, cómo regresa un PRI y la verdad de las cosas después de, yo digo, lo digo abierto, yo trabajé con el anterior presidente de la República, con Felipe Calderón, este, claro que había corrupción, siempre ha habido, pero sí creo que los niveles de corrupción regresaron de una manera muy fuerte y entonces hay, esto ha dividido enormemente a la sociedad, hay mucha polarización y de veras este, hay, hay, viene una elección fascinante en México para los que lo vamos a observar, pero también el vivirla eh, va a ser muy, muy va complicado y el tema de la corrupción va a ser central y ahí, así digamos, a pesar de Toda la crítica, y a pesar de que ya se le pintó de, de Hugo Chávez a López Obrador, me parece que tiene todavía muchas posibilidades, porque simple y sencillamente él en, encarna de alguna manera la lucha contra la corrupción de este gobierno actual. Okay. Daniel wants to, are you going to show us something? So I just have to ask you to condense it as much as possible. Well, <coughs> yeah, transnational. Quiero, me gustaría ser polémico. Volverle a poner una etiqueta de populismo de izquierda a la corrupción lo compro quizás parcialmente en Venezuela, recordando que el primer gran mega escándalo fue Carlos Andrés Pérez. Entonces, esto de darle partida a nacimiento, o sea, en, en México, vincular el tema de la corrupción con el narcotráfico en Venezuela y ponerle etiqueta de izquierda, ay, 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 en México, por Dios, o sea, gobernador tras gobernador de extrema derecha, con una vinculación, ni qué hablar en Colombia. Entonces, yo sí quiero ser en esto controversial. Creo que le hacemos un flaco favor al tema de la lucha contra la corrupción si le ponemos una etiqueta. Porque ahí le estamos dando partida a los Correa, a los Kirchner, a todos diciendo, ¿se dan cuenta? Vienen detrás de nosotros. Este no es un tema. Si es de derecha y es culpable, y lo encontramos culpable, va adentro. Y si es de derecha, lo mismo. Y si es de izquierda, lo mismo. Panamá, por ejemplo. Panamá, por ejemplo, pero también Guatemala. O sea, Otto Pérez Molina, hasta bueno. donde yo me conozco, no era una persona de izquierda ni del siglo XXI. Y ahí está. Con, o sea, ese me parece que es un tema. Segundo, es un fenómeno. Esa es la, 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 la cuenta que conocemos superficialmente de Odebrecht. 
10 millones en México, 18 en Guatemala, 59 en Panamá, 11 en Colombia, 33 en Ecuador, 29 en Perú, 35 en Argentina, que lo seguimos buscando todavía, 92 en República Dominicana, 98 en Venezuela, están en primer lugar, y 349 en Brasil. Esto es, digamos, de la, del notebook, de, 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 la, de la letra chiquita. Obviamente hay mucho más porque fueron mega. Esto es moneda de cambio. Estos son los vueltos que se han dado a ciertos funcionarios. Segundo, mire, esto es Lópezito. Son los 9 millones que López llevó a esconder en un monasterio en Argentina. Les garantizo que Lópezito no es de izquierda. Esto es de la gente del búnker donde guardan dinero en Brasil, lo encontraron hace tres semanas. Tardaron 14 horas la Policía Federal en contar 16 millones de dólares. Estas todas las valijitas en ese departamento. O sea, este es el nivel de orgía, de asco, de la mega corrupción que no es ni de izquierda ni de derecha. Y que además no es únicamente a nivel público, no es únicamente a nivel político. Esto tiene que ver con la mano que da y con la mano que recibe. Esto tiene que ver con los políticos y tiene que ver con los empresarios. Por eso tenemos que hacer alianzas público-privadas para darle, trabajando juntos de manera constructiva, moviéndonos de los escándalos a las propuestas, que es donde creo que nos gustaría poder conversar un poco. Bueno, ¿qué hacemos frente a esto? Esta es nuestra región. Bueno, esto yo empecé a hacer la lista de, y podríamos seguir. Pero esta es la región. Esos es son los países. Uruguay, Chile y Costa Rica, siempre arriba, y después hacia abajo tenemos todos los demás países. Es un problema endémico en la región. Ahora, ¿hay diversidad? Sí hay diversidad. Ahí están ca caracterizados. Guatemala, Haití, Nicaragua y Venezuela, los peores. Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, El Salvador y los demás en un segundo nivel, pero bastante malo. En tercer lugar, Brasil, Colombia, etc. Y solamente se salvan sin corrupción, o sea, con niveles muy bajos de corrupción, Chile, Costa Rica y Uruguay. Donde siempre, además. ¿Qué es lo de siempre, además? Que además coincide con nivel de desarrollo humano, coincide con los niveles de... Eh, control de corrupción y los indicadores de gobernabilidad del Banco Mundial, etc. Entonces, perdón que sea polémico, pero para mí el tema es, a 40 años, y esto es otra cosa que les quiero mostrar, a, a 40 años, este es lo que hemos hecho del 90 al 2015 que comienza tu pay off. Esta es la dimensión de las reformas que fuimos haciendo en materia de leyes de acceso a la información pública, en materia de leyes de transparencia, en materia de creación de fiscalías especiales, etcétera, etcétera, que está comenzando a dar resultados en la lucha contra la corrupción. Porque es cierto que ahí está el juez Moro y hay otros jueces jóvenes muy comprometidos en la lucha, pero sin la ley de leniencia, o sea, la posibilidad de negociar con las empresas para bajarle las penas si dan información. Pre -bar -bar sin la ley de delación premiada, sin el uso estratégico de la detención preventiva, etcétera, etcétera. Si no le damos esos instrumentos, sería muy poco. Y esos instrumentos, ¿saben a quién se los dio? Se los dio al PT. ¿Y sabe por qué se los dio en parte el PT? Fue cuando hubo las primeras onda de, 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 de protestas a nivel social donde se exigió, ¿se acuerdan los escándalos de corrupción por el mundial, etcétera? Entonces ahí se hicieron una serie de reformas que terminaron ahora siendo muy efectivas en la lucha contra la, contra la, la, la corrupción. Entonces ahí sí siento que nosotros llegamos a un momento en que le tenemos que quitar la etiqueta. Obviamente cada país tiene su especificidad, en eso estoy de acuerdo. Pero la única manera que vamos a salir inteligentemente es a través de una alianza público-privada, donde el sector privado junto con el sector político trabajan de manera conjunta en fortalecer institucionalidad, empezando por el rule of law, empezando por la justicia. No tenemos una justicia 40 años después que empezamos la transición a la democracia que esté a la altura en la mayoría de nuestros países para combatir eficientemente la corrupción, salvo contadas excepciones. Entonces ahí tenemos justicia. Después tenemos que tener contralorías, tenemos que tener todo un set de medidas que podemos conversar en el diálogo, si hay tiempo, y a su vez el sector privado tiene que venir como aliado estratégico aquí, a través del compliance, que es muy importante, pero también a través de las leyes de responsabilidad penal, hubo un avance ayer importante en Argentina en este, en este tema, y otras medidas como la ley de lobby, como la ley de puertas giratorias, como los temas de fideicomiso ciego y fideicomiso diversificado, que son instrumentos que le van a permitir, junto con una buena justicia, tener una buena caja de herramientas para combatir efectiva y eficientemente la corrupción. 
como un problema que nos afecta a todos, independientemente del color político que tenga cada uno en un momento determinado. That's great. And we're going to come back to, <laughs> to solutions in just a second. But before we get there, I just want to tease out one more strand of the international dimension of this. So as the great Odebrecht slide shows, this is a regional phenomenon, but these networks aren't just Latin American. And indeed, as we've all been learning in the last couple of years, they enjoy significant facilitation and enabling from institutions that are lodged in countries that are way on the green side of the Transparency International barometer. So, You work at Covington and Burling, just to be um, uh, uh, polemical, not polemical, but provocative. You know, law firms and real estate companies and, um, you know, what's it called, uh, uh, registered agents and uh, secrecy jurisdictions and things like that have been providing very significant both material facilitation for these networks, but also kind of image laundering services, not just money laundering services, but image laundering services. Can you tell us, you know, what that impact is and how we ought to be thinking about it? Well, as, as my, my friends here, uh, you know, I'm a lifelong academic, uh, Duke and Georgetown University, and I've worked on all of these issues from an academic point of view, theoretical point of view, but uh, as you say, m my, I'm now at Covington and Burling, uh, uh, one of the premier law firms that is working in, on global issues, uh, and I guess one of the things that's uh, struck me the most uh, is in fact how uh, all of these patterns we're talking about are really kind of global patterns, uh, and if we take the issue of corruption, you know, there's There's, there's one thing that, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, uh, some years ago I would have been very skeptical, um, you know, because of my own sort of politics and so on, about the extraterritoriality extra of the laws of a country like the United States and how it would be imposed in the rest of the world. When one sees what has happened with something like the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act today, one can't come but to the conclusion that in fact this has been a very beneficial force. Now, it's not U.S. imperialism, as Chavez would have said, that it is expanding as this, uh, it's just simply saying, listen, we require of our own companies and our own institutions to be, you know, uh, 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 follow the rule of law. And so you can't do insider trading, you go to prison. Uh, but it also means that if, We have a, a, a company that cannot compete in Nigeria because other companies are there doing things, and we will demand in the United States of those companies, you know, a certain kind of uh, uh, behavior, prohibit any kind of, of thing like this. Uh, that that then has had a phenomenal impact, and it. Uh, I'm I'm privileged to be working at a law firm that. That, that now has uh, perhaps the, the, you know, the most important uh, uh, white collar uh, crime practice uh, with Lanny Brewer, who was head of the, is, is, uh, for six years of the criminal division of the Department of Justice, who carried many of these FCPA cases against Siemens and so on and so forth for, for periods of time. And this is where we get back to the private sector as well. Companies all over the world, in country after country, are, are understanding that they themselves are hurt as well by this system that, that, that is so un uncompetitive, where people get advantage uh, by, by getting into an election and paying off officials before the election takes place so that they will be able to get spectrum, for example, uh, by the state or something like that. Uh, uh, so it, it, the, the impact is really uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, much of what we've seen with, with, with Odebrecht too. Uh, there are 600 lawyers at the Department of Justice who've been working on these sorts of things, and uh, I think that that has, has been very significant. Now, in country after country, people are looking, as Daniel very well said, how can we put in these sorts of things? Uh, uh, you know, the Foreign Agent Registration Act, you know, in the United States. 
Uh, by the way, there are a lot of people here, even in this town, who don't understand that if you're going to help some uh, other country or some other company from uh, abroad to do things here in Washington, that you also have to. Uh, some of the scandal that's thrown in the White House right now has to do with the Foreign registered Registration uh, Act because people didn't register, or the Lobby and Disclosure Act. The Chileans have gone this far. If you hire a group of people here in Washington, have good contacts in Chile, beware, because uh, you know, in Chile you'll have to say, who do you represent? And uh, you're going to have to say, what is it that you're told? Who do you want to meet with? How much are you being paid? What are you being discussed? And it'll be online. Now, with a, it'll be online, uh, as it is online here, too. You know, anybody who wants to figure out who's doing the lobbying for XXX should be able to go online and do that. These are the kinds of rules that we need. Now, we're just talking about one piece there on the executive. I'd like to just simply uh, r remind us that, w that, that it's reforms of institutions down the, the pike. What, is this is not a crisis. Corruption crisis is a crisis of institutions. It's a crisis of institutions that are still very much in the consolidation process. The reason why three countries stand out is because they were stronger democracies in the past. There's a path dependency there that's really quite clear. What is it that we really need to do in order to be able to combat corruption? Strengthen democratic institutions. And that's why we need to be worried also about populists, uh, by parties that have, that have been destroyed. Uh, we don't want to have too many independents. This is one of the things I worry a little bit about. There's some good guys are out there. We're independent. We're not, we're not contaminated. Let's be careful with the civil society rejection of politics, too, because in some ways that is part of the problem. Because if you re reject the politicians, you reject the parties, you, re you reject the institutions because they're all bad, then you become part of the problem. Uh, fix them. If you're going to run for office, create a party, but be sure that the rules for the parties are rules that make sure that, that, that in fact, you have a strong party, that you have programs, that you have, that this is not just some kind of personal project, you know? And this is one of the things that we've, we've, we've been finding out, you know? The proliferation of, of uh, so civil society organizations, too, that have a very, con uh, you, you know, adversarial, uh, and rightly so, you know, one celebrates what's going on right, right now in Guatemala in terms of civil society, out, uh, yet again. It's happened before, it's happened with Serrano as well, remember. <laughs> uh, you um, point to the good sides of compliance and the tightening of some of these regulations. On the other hand, what's interesting is most of the private sector still opposes, oppose the FCPA, opposes FARA, gets around FARA, and, you know, I mean, you had Lanny Davis and, and Hernandez under the, um, uh, you know, after the coup in, in Honduras, which is just one example of the kind of opposite role being played by a lot of private sector actors. So I, I, I want to keep that in the conversation, but Rafael yeah. is burning. <laughs> <laughs> what but they need to be held accountable. That's a key. They need to be held accountable, and that's what we want to see in all the countries in, in, the, in the hemisphere. Yeah, because I, I want to challenge Daniel. Uh, a ver, Daniel, esta sociedad público-privada que hablas, eh, yo no la veo tan, <laughs> tan, tan, tan fácil eh, porque yo veo un problema en las élites latinoamericanas. Es decir, por algún motivo Thank nuestras you. élites, las hondureñas, las brasileñas, las mexicanas, no han decidido apostar por el rule of law. De alguna manera les sigue interesando el status quo porque en ese están bien. Esa es la gran diferencia con Europa. Y la verdad de las cosas, mientras no apuestan por el rule of law, y, y, y aquí, digamos, realmente las grandes élites, al menos en mi país puedo decir, ante este tema de la corrupción no se han pronunciado. No las veo realmente tomando una decisión. Han sido los líderes sociales, han sido otras gentes. Entonces, Pero perdón, este, ¿cómo se explica entonces las, los tres países excepcionales? Los tres países excepcionales, no porque las élites sean mucho más eh, necesariamente, porque el Estado de Derecho ha sido un Estado de Derecho que viene de mucho antes. O sea, si tú permites la impunidad, entonces ahí va ese, ese es el problema. En, el, en los tres casos, es el eh, desafío. en el caso de Chile, claramente, tú tienes ya un orden legal, histórico, cultural, que no hemos logrado en los otros países. Hay también algo cultural, ¿por qué no sancionamos, digamos, a los corruptos? ¿Por qué aceptamos seguir 
estando en el mismo cuarto con aquel político que ya sabemos que... Entonces, sí hay, hay un tema de élites, claro, Daniel, claro. que tenemos que cambiar y, y, y me parece, digamos, que, que hasta que la, las élites no decidan de alguna manera hacer un cambio, yo veo difícil este rulo global, que va junto con pegado con el tema de la corrupción. Mira, en los últimos... En el último año se produjeron a nivel mundial dos hechos muy, muy parecidos, aunque tienen sus especificidades. Una presidenta en Brasil y una presidenta en Corea del Sur fueron destituidas. Una está presa, la otra no, porque no, hasta ahora no tiene nada que ver con un tema de corrupción, sino que tiene que ver con una cuestión de manejo de presupuesto. Pero los dos empresarios más importantes de cada uno de esos países, Marcelo de Brecht, 19 años y 4 meses, y el hijo, actual CEO de Samsung, porque el padre con un stroke está fuera del negocio, alrededor de cinco años, están presos. Esto es un hecho inédito. Si en, hubiéramos estado conversando hace tres años, cuatro años, y hubiéramos dicho, eh, Marcelo de Brecht termina 19 años y cuatro meses preso, uno hubiera dicho, imposible. Como él dijo, se acaba la república. Sí. cuando detuvieron a Yusef, el financista que comenzó por delación premiada, dijeron, si yo les cuento todo lo que sé, se cae la república. En la perspectiva de si metemos al dueño de Samsung en Corea, conociendo la interrelación entre los chobols y el gobierno, se cae Corea. No, ni se cayó Corea ni se cayó Brasil. O, obviamente hay turbulencia, hay volatilidad, etc. Entonces, ese es un primer punto. Vivimos un mundo nuevo. Yo creo que lo más importante que yo... Si a mí me dijeran, resume la conferencia de Fernando Enrique Cardoso hoy en menos de 20 segundos, diría, la profunda transformación social en la que como mundo estamos viviendo. Y esa transformación social es una transformación cultural también. Vos lo dijiste al inicio de tu conversación. Nunca habíamos visto a la sociedad civil en México diciendo hasta aquí. Tú lo dijiste. O sea, comenzamos a ver una transformación. No podemos esperar que las élites, pacientemente, nadie se mueve de su comfort zone. Hay que empujar, hay que presionar. Pero creo que también inteligentemente hay un sector político y hay un sector empresarial que está entendiendo que hoy se va jugando en un mundo nuevo y que es mejor. Así como con el tema de medio ambiente, ¿m? que uno tiene que ir adaptando sus empresas, así como en el tema de responsabilidad social, que uno tiene que agregarle valor a la comunidad en la cual trabaja y no solamente extraer profit, también se está generando un cambio cultural muy importante. Y lo que hay que hacer es, nosotros lo estamos haciendo en Argentina con un grupo que se llama RAP. Hemos puesto 15 empresarios de muy alto nivel con 15 políticos de muy alto nivel trabajando conjuntamente para ver cómo analizamos los temas de corrupción, tráfico de influencia, conflicto de interés y financiamiento político de manera constructiva, de manera proactiva, porque no alcanza con sacar las manzanas podridas. Lo que hay que hacer es cambiar los incentivos de la economía política de corrupción. Y lo brillante de RAP, por ejemplo, Margarita, es que ahí están presentes todos los partidos. Exacto. O sea, tú para hacerte un político RAP y participar en estas cosas, ¿ah? tienes que decir que estamos de acuerdo con algunos fundamentos. Y para cerrar, Coincido con Fukuyama en su último libro, Política al Orden en Política al Decay. Yo creo que en estos 40 años el proceso de transición a la democracia, como si fuera una carroza con tres caballos, avanzamos bastante bien con todas las deficiencias que comparto en materia de la democracia política. Estamos muy electoral. Estamos muy atrás con el rule of law. Esa es la gran asignatura pendiente. Tenemos que hacer un gran consenso nacional y regional de fortalecer el rule of law. Brown, el ex primer ministro de Inglaterra, cuando le preguntaron si era muy difícil, dijo, bueno, cuesta los primeros 500 años y después fácil. <risa> <risa> Quizá no necesitemos 500 años. El tercero es state capacity. O sea, no tenemos una burocracia, no tenemos políticas públicas, etc. Entonces, tenemos que hacer el catch-up, seguir mejorando la, la dimensión electoral de la democracia, pero hacer un catch-up en materia de justicia, hacer un, un, un catch-up en materia de institucionalidad, porque esos tres elementos son los que permiten resolver los tres problemas que tú presentaste. El problema de la violencia, el problema de la desigualdad y el problema de la corrupción. Um, sometimes those def deficits in capacity are deliberate. They're actually created. Margarita is dying to say something, but um, I think we're going to turn to you guys. And so, Margarita, just be sure that you say 
whatever it is you wanted to say <laughs> as we, I so just know if I can remember. <laughs> yeah, no, note it down, note it down. Uh, why don't we take three to start with and, and take them in groups like that, but I think we're only going to uh, have about 15 minutes for, uh, for questions. So do you have mics that are going to run around the room? Yes. Yeah? Uh, so put your hands up, anyone who wants to, uh, I thought I saw one there, didn't I? Me. Okay, we're pressed for time. So one round of three? Okay. Did I see one in the middle there someplace? Yes, I saw one right there in the very middle of the middle row. Could you uh, wait for the mic? And could you please identify yourself? Buenas tardes, soy Raimundo, vengo de México. Este, yo lo que te quisiera preguntar, Daniel. Este, hablabas muy en específico de que tenemos un problema con las políticas <coughs> públicas, que no tenemos un estado de gobernabilidad. ¿Tú cómo, nos, cómo ves el panorama de México para el 18? Para el 2018 que vienen nuestras elecciones como país. Sí. No other questions? One back there, again in the middle in green, a lady. Podemos corromper a alguien para que... Gracias. Maribel Flores del Tecnológico Monterrey, en México. De hecho, venimos un, un grupo de estudiantes de México también. Nos interesa mucho este tema. Yo quiero preguntarles si a nivel regional, porque han mencionado varios países de, de, de la región de América Latina, ¿hay algún movimiento que hayan detonado o estén impulsando los jóvenes para prevenir y combatir la corrupción? Porque veo mucha iniciativa de parte del sector privado, think tanks, ONGs, las universidades en general y demás, pero quiero saber si los jóvenes están haciendo algo y en dónde para tenerlo como un marco de referencia. And one other. Up front, right here. Muchas gracias. Miguel Simán del Salvador. Me gustaría regresar al tema de las soluciones y tal vez puedo apreciar que de cada uno de ustedes un best practice o una medida innovadora que todos podamos aprender para combatir la corrupción. Great. Great. Margarita, could you go first on any of those you want to pick <laughs> up plus whatever it was you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, bueno, uh, let me see if I can go on with this. No, the first thing I wanted to say was about the sanctions, sanctions that are going out due to corruption and the, the OFAC list, OFAC, Sí, list. Ah, estaba hablando en español. <laughs> Pásame por el español. Eh, yo creo que también la discusión es interesante porque depende del sitio donde uno esté puesto, parado. O sea, indudablemente Daniel está parado desde una panorámica que le, que le permite ser optimista. Yo estoy parada de, desde, un, desde una dinámica que no me permite ser optimista, sino más bien todo lo contrario. Y yo lo que, lo, que, eh, lo que sí quería añadir a la discusión que estábamos haciendo es que en esas, eh, eh, en, el, el, el aumento de la influencia internacional en este momento para combatir la corrupción, cuando llega a estos extremos de, 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 del crimen organizado, transnacional, penetrando el Estado y cooptando la, los espacios del Estado y utilizando eh, en los Estados nacionales como un sitio para hacer los negocios, es que en ese momento la comunidad internacional adquiere una mayor, un mayor peso que incluso los actores nacionales. ¿no? Eh, eh, en las buenas prácticas que alguien que estaba mencionando acá, por lo menos para nosotros los venezolanos que seguimos la coyuntura venezolana, no vemos la capacidad en este momento desde adentro solo de actuar para parar esta, esta cometida que es una mezcla, no es nada más corrupción, es violencia, es desigualdad, es destrucción, es Estado que camina hacia el colapso. ¿no? Entonces, en, en, es, en esas situaciones, para nosotros es obligatorio tener que tomar en cuenta el apoyo de la comunidad internacional, un apoyo internacional este, que va, va a tener que ser no puntual, va a tener que ser un apoyo internacional sostenido, en recursos y en monitoreo, que es la única manera, y, y en coordinación con los actores domésticos, con los actores internos. O sea, ¿no? eh, eh, yo creo que por lo menos en este momento en Venezuela existe una gran presión internacional para que el gobierno vuelva al hilo constitucional. 
es muy, muy incierta la situación del país porque, en efecto, los privilegios, la corrupción, los privilegios y la impunidad han hecho co a cohesionar a la cúpula militar y civil que se niega a salir del poder porque los negocios son demasiado buenos, ¿no? Este, y, y, y a, o por temor a las sanciones internacionales. Entonces, en ese, en ese ámbito, yo creo que una de las prácticas más importantes, porque creo que toda América Latina no son esas cosas que dice Daniel, creo que también hay casos este, más cercanos al pesimismo que yo puedo tener sobre Venezuela, este, es que necesitamos una coordinación de la comunidad internacional proactiva en, estas, en estos penesteres con actores internos democráticos proactivos en estos menesteres que permitan una salida este, que produzca cierto éxito para las sociedades como la venezolana, este, que pueda reconstruir de nuevo o construir un Estado democrático y llegar al siglo XXI con algunas garantías de bienestar y de igualdad para sus para su, para su ciudadanos. Gracias. Could I ask both of you to uh, field the Mexico question, but briefly? Daniel, it was aimed at you. I think that the Mexican should address the Mexico. Okay. <laughs> You're very kind. <laughs> <laughs> eh, brevemente, creo que la elección de México es importantísima y puede ser tan divisiva como la de 16 en Estados Unidos. Me parece que, digamos, no veo un candidato ciudadano, desgraciadamente, y lo que veo es eh, una, pelea, un, una elección de dos. Ya te, sabemos uno de los contendientes, que es Andrés Manuel López Obrador, y me parece que ya sea el, el PRI, si saca un buen candidato o el PAN, uno de los dos, o, o el PRD, si hay coalición, pero se va a caer algún candidato y me parece que finalmente, digamos, va a ser una carrera López Obrador y en contra de López Obrador. Este, un México tremendamente polarizado y algo muy importante. Y una vez aprovecho para decirle a Miguel, ¿qué práctica? La práctica que está tratando de imponer México es una práctica, digamos, de lo que nos ha salido bien. ¿Qué nos ha salido bien? Si fortalecer las instituciones, ciudadanizarlas en el caso del Instituto Nacional Electoral. Entonces, eso se quiere hacer con este, digamos, comité anticorrupción, ciudadanizar y darle fuerza a una institución. Eh, o bien, también nos re, me recuerda al Banco Central, que, que hay, es decir, darle independencia a las instituciones y fortalecerlas. Esa es, me parece que ese, por ahí tiene que venir eh, eh, parte eh, de esto. Ahora, quiero decir algo. A México y a la América Latina más del norte, más conectada por la migración, porque realmente hay varias Américas Latinas, me parece que Estados Unidos nos mueve mucho. Mucho, la, digamos, la democracia electoral en México fue muy influida por NAFTA, por, el, eh, eh, por Estados Unidos. Sin embargo, ahora, a mí me parece, digamos, que en el, pensando en el mundo, a mí me parece increíble que, no hay, que haya muy poca gente o prácticamente no haya más banqueros de Wall Street en la cárcel. Es decir, el impacto que tuvo en el mundo la corrupción del do, del, digamos, del principio de, de, de este milenio en Wall Street, que lo seguimos pagando todos los habitantes del mundo, es increíble. Y además ahora teniendo al presidente más rico del mundo, lo más rico en la historia de Estados Unidos, que llega a la presidencia, la verdad de las cosas es que el ejemplo que estamos recibiendo, perdón que lo pongo así, este de, del norte, no es, no es muy sano, exactly. al menos para la América exactly. Latina del norte. Yeah. Tenemos poco que aprenderle, al contrario, y sí hay un dejo de yep. decir cómo no se les juzga a ellos con la misma vara que se nos juzga a nosotros. Sí hay una cosa muy fuerte. Ahí. Yeah. I'll field the um, youth uh, question and just recommend that you look in particular at uh, Burkina Faso and at uh, South Korea. If you look at those two movements, the youth absolutely led the way. They are really interesting, quite profound transformations of both of those societies. And the youth made, uh, in some cases, they were through, well, actually, in, in South Korea, they were more allied with, um, I want to say, known structures. In Burkina Faso, it was an entirely new movement uh, led by a singer. Um, and maybe can you guys just pick up on the, because you both have spoken to the best practices just very quickly. Sure, look, but I also wanted to tell her 
that what you need to do, there are groups, all kinds of uh, young people's groups in Latin America and Mexico and other places like that. But if you don't like one, form one right exactly. now. And, and <laughs> stand back there, you know, and have people sign up. Los mexicanos van a hacer fila acá atrás, ¿eh? Los jóvenes mexicanos, ¿ya? Y eso te incluye a ti. Bueno, uh, look, best practices, transparency, Miguel. Uh, transparency, I mean, uh, you know, you, to get the rule of law, you need to have transparency. And I think that, you know, the fundamental issue that we've been talking about is abiding by the rule of law, and for that you need transparencia. Me llevo con alegría, por primera vez me califican de optimista, esto que un argentino termine siendo el optimista. <laughs> Verdaderamente. <laughs> Porque los venezolanos ahora los ganamos a todos. Es, es sinónimo del, del proceso profundo de transformación social que estamos viviendo. Un par de cositas. Lo de México, Raimundo, México va a ser el único país de América Latina que va a tener un candidato que en este momento podría llegar a ser presidente que ha perdido las últimas dos elecciones declarando fraude. La gran pregunta en México es, ¿se aguanta el cimbronazo político México de una tercera eventual derrota por un margen, Dios no quiera que ocurra, cercano como ocurrió frente a Calderón con un INE que está atravesando una situación de mucha presión. Ese es, ese es un tema eh, muy importante con las nuevas reglas que hay de que si hay exceso en el financiamiento político se podría apelar la nulidad de la elección y eso le pondría una carga brutal de presión al Tribunal, eh, al tribunal Electoral del Poder Judicial de la Federación como ya ha sido con el tema de la elección en el Estado de México. O sea que ahí hay que ponerle mucho, mucho seguimiento a ese tema. Creo que, que es muy serio. En, en términos de buenas prácticas, yo les había, eh, nosotros teníamos otra, otra, o, eh, et, esto, esto demuestra, me parece importante, el impacto de la corrupción en el tema de la credibilidad de los presidentes. Fíjense ustedes la caída, ¿eh? prácticamente con una pista de esquí hacia abajo, con presidentes con, como Temer, con el 5% que obviamente está haciendo reforma, está manejando porque está arreglando dentro del Congreso, pero de cara a la sociedad, pero no es solamente el único. Peña Nieto en algún momento, 18%, 18 y así muchos otros presidentes. Entonces, ese es un, un tema. Ahora, en términos de buenas prácticas, nosotros con el grupo RAP estamos trabajando el concepto de qué sugerir al sector privado y al sector político para trabajar en este tema partiendo de la definición de Klitgar, que dice que corrupción es igual a monopolio, más discrecionalidad, menos transparencia y rendición de cuentas, menos impunidad. Y entonces estamos trabajando en esas cinco categorías. ¿Cómo reducimos monopolios? ¿Cómo limitamos la discrecionalidad? ¿Cómo mejoramos transparencia? ¿Cómo aseguramos accountability? ¿Cómo evitamos impunidad? Con medidas concretas para cada una de las cosas. En los cuatro ámbitos. En materia de educación ciudadana, en materia de prevención, en materia de control y en materia de investigación de sanción. Similar a lo que hace la ICAC, que es la Agencia contra la Corrupción de Hong Kong, que yo les doy como, como, como un consejo, hay que mirar esa experiencia. Es cierto que culturalmente es diferente, pero lo que ha hecho Hong Kong en los últimos 30, 40 años en materia de lucha contra la corrupción es importante. Y después, identificando en cada país cuáles son los ámbitos más proclives a corrupción y desagregando en detalle. Por ejemplo, todo lo que tiene que ver con compras y obras públicas, lo que tiene que ver con subsidios, entes reguladores, marco regulatorio, policía y narcotráfico, si es el caso. Y después lo que estamos haciendo es identificando de las intervenciones anticorrupción cuáles son las que están dando mejor resultado y cuál es la combinación de las medidas anticorrupción que tenemos que hacer. Entre ellos, utilizando de manera estratégica el tema de la tecnología. Ese es el principal aliado que tenemos. A partir de ahora, el tema de la tecnología se convierte en nuestro aliado número uno en la lucha contra la corrupción y pone en mucha dificultad a aquellos que no quieran ajustarse. Entre otras cosas, el tema de Panama Papers con el tema de hackeo. Ya no hay nada seguro y por lo tanto en un mundo donde no hay nada seguro y todo se puede conocer, es mucho mejor comenzar hacer las cosas lo más adecuado posible. No va a ser fácil. No, I have to stop you. Now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much.
fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Margarita, folks. Nice to meet you. Likewise. I would love to.